Hello, welcome to Jordan Sorcery's GW Books Club. This is the first ever episode of this brand new monthly video that's going to be on the channel every single month. And we're going to be taking the first 17 of GW Books' books and talking about them. I'm joined here by my good friend Stu from the Miniatures Realms channel. Stu, hello. 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 Nice to be here. It's a bit sweaty this evening in the <laughs> in my office so you can see me if i mopping my brow in the, the background but uh, and as, as usual we've been, we've been chatting for ages beforehand which um tends we to have, uh... we have but we've not <laughs> exhausted all of the good conversation no. that is still to come because we haven't even touched on the contents of our first book which is ignorant armies so this was the first book published by gw books in 1989 it's an anthology of stories that is what we're going to be talking about in this episode we're going to go through each of those stories we're going to talk a little bit about the story itself we're going to talk about the context and a little bit about what we liked and what we didn't like and what we thought it was really about if there was any hidden messages or if it gave us more information about the warhammer world or if we just enjoyed it or even if we didn't as well which you know we'll see if there's any of those in this particular collection uh I did just want to give a quick call out to my exclusive patreon book chat which is something that I, i'm going to be doing every single month ahead of these videos so all of my patrons get to join me in a live stream where we talk about the book at length this one for ignorant armies ended up being two and a half hours plus and we went into real detail about every single one of these stories we shared trivia we shared thoughts and theories and all sorts of different stuff it was really great fun i had a fantastic time and we're going to be doing that for every one of these books about a week before this particular video comes out. So if you want to be involved in that, then you can join my Patreon and you can join all of us in this new community of GW Books readers as we go through them step by step, all 17 of the original GW Books. And if you want to just follow here on the channel, that is great as well. I will be bringing all of the cool stuff that we talk about in the Patreon exclusive chats into this conversation too. So Stu and I can mull it over and see what we think were the best comments and what was the coolest stuff. Great. Right. So, Stu, what, what, have you got a history with GW Books? Have you read all these books before? Have you read some of them? What's your sort of story here? Well, I've, not, I've read two now. Right. <laughs> the, <laughs> right. So prior to this, um, it was Route 666. Um, was, uh, I, can't, I can't even remember buying it, but I remember owning it as a teen. And my... My teen era was pretty much everything your channel covers in terms of GW <laughs> stuff. So the the third edition fantasy and the you know, Road Trader and Dark Future and all the things that came out during that kind of late 90s or early 90s, mid 90s era before I went off to uni and pretended I wasn't a geek for a few years. So I had that book and I absolutely loved it. Um, I think it was you know around the time I first watched Mad Max and things like that. So <laughs> the game really, really grabbed me at the time. But I didn't read any of the other novels. I didn't read any at all. So um, I've, I've been aware of them for years, and I've I've always been interested. In, oh, I might pick them up one day. But mm -hmm. as the years have gone on and they've become out of print and harder and more expensive to get hold of, I've just not really thought about it. And then in more recent years, Black Library have put out some really excellent stuff, and I've been sort of devouring that really. So it's mm -hmm really interesting to go back and look at the kind of early origins of fiction from from games workshop it's fascinating isn't it so I, I also had not read these and similarly they've always been there i've always known they were around they've dropped in and out of print most of them some of them have never been reprinted but i've kind of looked at them on the shelf and thought oh well you know one day i'll get around to it and then i never have until this year when i decided okay actually i'm going to give it a go and i read Drakenfels, which we'll be talking about next time. And I absolutely loved it. And then I made the history of GW books and I got to experience a little touch of each one of these books as I was researching them. And that is why I really wanted to start this book club because it is, some of the stories that, is, that are in here are super interesting. It's of such an interesting time in the development of Warhammer and the history of the game and 40K as well, when it wasn't quite this cohesive thing there's still so much stuff that's that's moving around this melting pot of ideas uh and and we know obviously what those universes have gone on to become but this is something very there's a kind of 
primordial aspect to this. This is all super interesting and and anything goes in some of these stories as we'll see when we get to them. <laughs> so yeah, I, I I this was the first time I'd read Ignorant Armies and I'm I'm very glad I did. I'll I'll put it that way and we <laughs> we can come back to the sort of the final view as we as we get into it. So let's start then with the first one. Uh the first story in this collection it is Geheimnis Nacht by William Bill King, and this is the first Gotrek and Felix story. So I, I will also just point out that I, I have to apologize. I'm sure there'll be very many comments about my pronunciation of Gotrek. Uh, it will change. It will go back and forth. I do my best, but when I first read it as a child, it, it just got imprinted in my brain as, as the wrong pronunciation, so I apologize to everyone about that. <laughs> Felix, I can say that without problem. That's all right. <laughs> But this story is the very first time we will get to see this famous troll slayer and his friend. This is the first story in all of the GW books history. And it is about two characters who will go on to exist for decades and still one of them at least exists to this day, even despite the end of the Warhammer world. So an incredible first starting point. And this story is about... Felix, Felix Jaeger, a former radical who has uh, pledged his life to this troll slayer who saved him from a uh, during a riot. There was some cavalry that was going to crush him, and Gotrek grabs him and saves him. And together they are now just traveling the lands and almost doing good deeds in a way. And on this particular night, Geheimnis Nacht, this creepy Halloween esque night, they encounter a black coach on the road which almost runs them down they then follow up on this particular mysterious coach at this nearby inn where they find out that a young son of the innkeeper has gone missing can they go and rescue the the innkeeper's son up at the weird standing stones where rituals take place and maybe there's something a bit shady happening gotrek is absolutely up for this felix is perhaps a little bit more reticent, but together they go into the night. They encounter all kinds of griblies and and cultists and and what have you. They interrupt this particular ritual, save the day, save the child, and that's kind of this story, I think. Right? That's fair to say. I mean, how how did you feel about this first story in the collection, Stu? It's one I've read many times, so it's the first story in Troll Slayer, which I've read recently to my son, um, mm -hmm. who's. He's eight at the moment, so he's not nine till November. <laughs> uh, you you made a comment in the Patreon chat and someone else had read it to their eight-year-old child, I think a daughter. I don't know who it was, but you said, well, that was brave. And there are some, there's the odd line or two, I have to admit, that um, gets a little bit close to the mark with certain things. But um, most of it is just kind of real rip roaring fantasy fair with mm. with um heroes taking on um, a lot of mutants seems to be a prevailing thing um but i, I i'm i've got a very big place in my heart for, for gotrek and felix i've i've read all of the original bill king books absolutely love his writing um and I, i've read the nathan long books as well i've not read the more modern versions not not because i'm <laughs> angry at the, <laughs> the change in the world as such just because i haven't got around to it and i've moved on but a l really fond um connection with these stories and and it's really nice to see that at essence their connection and the way they are together doesn't really change mm -hmm. you learn more about their history because you you gave a little bit of a background to how they became you know, how they came together um and they both got a lot more in their background that you sort of learn and develop throughout the novels which i don't want to spoil here i suppose um but it's um it's yeah it's it's a lovely start to the book and a very strong start i think mm. um and very warhammer and still feels very warhammer even though the style has changed slightly mm. still instantly recognizable as warhammer whether that's mostly down to the characters and they feel like warhammer I don't know, but it's um, it's it definitely feels very Warhammer, especially compared to a few other stories. A little bit more out of the way, we'll cover later. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I I agree. I think it's it's really Warhammery, for want of a better word. And I, it's almost you're right. I think when you say it's this kind of rip roaring adventure, and it's a great start to the collection, and it's a great start to GW books, I think as well, because it really brings you in. It's super accessible because it is just these two adventurers 
yeah, it's a bit of a creepy quest that are going on into the darkness of this forest, but it's also just very easily understandable. There is someone who is in trouble, and these two heroes are going to go and intervene and save the day. There are some complications in the sort of fabric of that story. The nature of the evil is obviously a bit more nuanced because we're talking about chaos and, and the, the weirdness of chaos, especially at this time when chaos was not quite the the version of chaos that we would see today i mean i think one of my uh one of the patreons on the discussion anvil of doom said that there's a grayness to the effects of chaos mm -hmm. during this era and i think that's absolutely right there's kind of not quite the same it's definitely this is once you're corrupted by chaos this is the full thing that's going to happen to you um yeah. there's like a weird kind of sliding scale of uh, being corrupted and the, the chaotic effects and the cultists and all that sort of stuff. And we see some of that in this story. We'll see way more of that in later mm -hmm. stories. But in this one, you get that first taste of chaos is weird, but it's also got some other stuff going on as well. Uh, almost like, do should we feel sorry for people that have been tainted by chaos? It's almost treated yeah. a little bit more like being bitten by a, a zombie or um, being ill, like lepers or something almost. It's that yeah. kind of, it, rather than that sort of very straight line, well, they, they wanted to do it and then they're often on their, on their path to uh, skulls and blood or whatever it happens to be. It definitely feels a little bit more like some, the more educated characters, maybe a question a little bit more, I feel a bit, a little bit of guilt about chopping that mutant's head off because that would have been a person once, whereas some of the more simpler folk are portrayed more as a kind of scared burn the witch kind of things. It's very middle ages as well. And it's, and it's got a presentation of it, but um, yeah. Absolutely, yeah, and the it's funny as well. Oh, that's, it, yeah, and that's how it offsets the the what is quite often grimness of it. It's really fun. Their interactions between the characters is funny. Obviously, yeah. that develops a lot more through. So my mind is muddled with how many books I've read of them, <laughs> and even recently. But I love the humor, and that's one of the things that my eight year old loves as well. So Felix mm. has got a quite a dry, sarcastic humor at times. Gotrix, just he's quite sassy. Yeah, and and then Gotrix just doesn't care and he's blunt and, and you know and it's uh, I, the old hammer podcast um i'm sure that'll be brought up a few times in our, our chat today i loved his yeah. version of it and his his brummy um got trek <laughs> really threw me at first because i'm so used to hearing him sounding like a yorkshireman or something and it was it was brilliant it was made a different changes but um it's the the act Accent and and the audio performance. If you listen to the audiobooks, is really builds out the the humor as well. And I, I wind my son up if he can't do something, he can't open a bottle or something. I'll be like, "You're weak, mulling." And it's kind of become a it's become a joke within our sorry terrible terrible impression. But we've it's something that's we have humor with now, and that that runs through through this in a way that again something like some of the other stories might not later on. And it's like you said it's a really strong start to the the book because yeah. of that. I think because I've I've never read any Gotrek and Felix story. So this is literally the first one I've read. So I'm obviously being immersed in Warhammer and Warhammer lore for decades. I know who they are. I know their sort of broad characters and, and their various exploits. I've just never sat down and read those stories. So to see here how well constructed their relationship is they have a really strong dynamic they are really clear and well-defined characters as well i almost didn't expect it to be quite as well written as that for a first story especially for the first story of the whole franchise yeah it they re you really do get the sense you know there is this gotrek character who has done something we don't know what it is but he's been exiled and now he is on this quest for redemption and it's it is a a more grounded certainly at this point i mean i believe it maybe gets less grounded and his tale becomes more extravagant <laughs> i guess but in this one it's a very grounded version of a slayer you know and everyone always loves slayers and everyone always does an impression of a slayer when there's a dwarf army on the table but this is a guy who has experienced some kind of tragedy or event in his life he's done something wrong or something wrong has happened and now he just wants to find his death and he and you know he's going to find it wherever it comes and, yeah. and there's quite and you know there's a it it isn't as one note as that could be i think there's a bit more nuance to him i felt more depth about him than just being a caricature 
yeah and that comes out more through the uh, i suppose in the first the first book the 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 um the, the, the first book overall and out the, through all the short stories are in it you get more and more from both characters you find out that felix is his, his oath sworn to him to basically document his doom and tell his story um and it's kind of both of their personalities grow in that sense and um it's mm. very good you de- you should definitely when you have time you should definitely read it i've got a few books the, on the on the shelf to go. you'll enjoy skaven slayer i think i think I or will. maybe or maybe not <laughs> <laughs> in which way you're looking at it yeah i do find it hilarious that the the titles because obviously they they fall into that rhythm of slayer something slayer whatever it might be troll slayer skaven slayer and now they've ended up with realm slayer because now he's they didn't he's not, know how many they're gonna have to do. yeah absolutely and he's not just fighting a single skaven now he's fighting the universe basically yeah. so yeah i think he's lost a bit now <laughs> but the uh the the other thing with felix as well as a quite a defined character yeah he has that sort of sardonic sass he is he's kind of sly comments out of the corner of his mouth he feels he also feels quite well well rounded because again it could be quite one note in that he's he could just be a coward who is like I I have to be here but I don't want to be and I'm afraid and he has that fear in the story but he also is brave enough to overcome it and he gets stuck in when the the time is right he he sort of is competent as well so I I really liked them and I enjoyed this story a lot yeah it was it's very good definitely yeah. definitely. The, I mean, you mentioned the manling thing. I was just going to say the first line, which is curse all manling coach drivers and all manling women. <laughs> Mutters <laughs> Kotrek Gurnison <laughs> adding a curse in Dwarvish. And yeah, it, it, it's just, it's an odd, fun line. That it, yeah, it just totally establishes the, the nature of this dwarf in one line, I think. It follows up afterwards as well. I've not got it open in front of me, but it's essentially starts with a joke, doesn't it? It's, it's a the first the first line, the first paragraph is a gag, yeah, because it's because it's then Felix's reaction to to um, Gotrek groaning and grumbling and uh, and moaning, and that pretty much sums up what all their all their stories are like in one <laughs> sense or another, with a bit of a stupid. Um, a bravery maybe in it and some heroism at times as well but it's they're all very very similar they just work that they're just very simple mm. um easy it's almost a bit like a classic rpg story isn't it when you go off and you get your mission so they've gone into the tavern haven't they mm. you set the scene so that's the black coach going by they go into the tavern and then they get given their quest and then they go off to see their quest, but they mess it up in a bit, and they can't go back and collect their uh, their uh, their cash at the end because they find out something that compromises their uh, their return to the the, the tavern. Um, I quite, yeah, can't really I like bring it. Can't well. really bring his. Can't really bring his son back. And we found yeah. out his, uh, the, the, the the door that went missing the year before was was there as well. And, mm. Um. So yeah, I, I like that as well. Yeah. So it's it's kind of dry, dark humor. It's kind of. Um, I don't know. It's not. It's not just. It's not too grim. So there's no dead babies at the end of it. The baby was saved, but the, the hun of all of that euphoria about the victory is taken away by the, hmm. the reality of it. I suppose, but it's still kind of slightly amusing. When we can't go back to the village, kind of feel rather than. Yeah. So um, which it's, yeah, yeah, and I but I, I like that, and I think you because the, the, the classic tale that that Bill King tells is that he based this on his own Warhammer Fantasy roleplay adventures. And I think you're right. You, that that through line definitely is there in terms of the adventure structure. But I quite like that, like a good game of Wolf Rub, yeah, like you say, there is a darkness to the ending. It's normally sober. There's, you know, thing, you may well have saved the day, but it's not pretty. It's not a nice, neat bow tied on it. I mean, in this one, they do, there's a nice note of, almost like quite happy sweet ending in that they save the baby like you say and then they drop that off at a a, a temple of shalaya and and ride off in the black coach that they've stolen which is quite a, a cool ending but yeah there, there's but not then... everyone's happy the people in the <laughs> yeah. village there's a cost yeah they're exactly. gonna find a mess <laughs> yeah someone's someone's got to clear up what happened in the woods and it's not yeah it's it's, it's gonna take a lot of shovels and uh and a, and a lot of sadness i imagine but so there is that element to it that keeps it Warhammer. Yeah, and quite grounded as well. It's not there is a there are consequences to these kinds of adventures. You don't you don't just get to save the day and there's no, you know, and that's it. It's nice and neat and clean. The as you mentioned, the uh 
old hammer fiction podcast which I, I agree absolutely fantastic really good versions of these stories i will put some links in the description below so people can check those out as well if you've not been able to get hold of a copy of the the book as lewis mentions at the end of his reading of this story there's also a really nice sort of aspect to it that the people who find the consequences the aftermath of it can't distinguish they, they don't see it as a hero turned up to save the day they think that everything that gotrek and felix have done and all the devastation that they've left where they've destroyed all these chaos cultists they think that's part of the ritual because it looks so messy and bloody and you know <laughs> and violent uh, and, and that's it the, the nature it's almost this whole thing of of yeah gotrek is, is doing the right thing and saving the day but his methods almost look like the same kind of chaos that he's yeah. stopping and that's quite an interesting little Warhammer-y end point as well to, to kind Absolutely. of question the heroes. Yeah. But it's a great story. I'm, I'm, I enjoyed it a lot. Definitely. Well, it's it's, uh, it's going to, that was always a strong start for me. And the, some of the other stories were always going to be up against it with my, my love of Godric and Phoenix, but we shall see as we, as we go <laughs> on. Yeah. So the second story, the Reavers and the dead by Charles Davidson. This is, Probably, it's not a simpler story, but it's a very different tone and feel, I think, to what we just had with Geheimnisnack. So in this tale, a young man, Helmut Kurzer, who hates his life living in this fishing village and, and just having to live day to day there, has started to dabble in a little bit of necromancy, as some kids are wont to do, sneaking up into the graveyard, playing around and bringing animals back to life. But then Norse raiders arrive to assault the village and slaughter everybody who's there. Kurza hides in the graveyard and he discovers this access route into some chambers of a long dead lich who basically offers him a deal. Become my apprentice. Give me some of your life almost and I'll give you some of my power and then you can go and get revenge on these Norse raiders. And then he does this. He takes up the deal brings back to life all of the villagers, including his own family who have been killed, and wipes out the Norse raiders, and then goes back into this little chambers to presumably live a long and happy life as a brand new <laughs> lich. So <laughs> what what were your what was your how did you feel about this story as the follow up as the next story in the book? I quite enjoyed it. Um it's um there was some of it was very predictable. You can almost guess what was going to happen from the the first moments he he goes into the um the, the burial chamber. Mm. Um, but there were some other elements that were quite stood out as different. The conversation between Hel Helmut's parents about him always being, a, you know, a bit of a, a useless child, and the, the the father's clearly not very proud of him, and almost blames it on the mother, sort of thing, isn't it? They've almost disowned him and, and don't want him, which is quite dark, really. Yeah. They were wishing they had wishing they could have another child because the first one's a, a, a bit of a dud. And yeah. and I can imagine a lot of teenagers reading that and feeling they are the you know they're an introverted child, which many of us gamers maybe were or, or still inverted at the time. Um, and it feels like kind of there's a little bit of a connection with the the kind of the bullied child, the friendless person, the the, the different person, the misunderstood. Um, um, and so you've got that kind of build up to it, but he, unlike an 80s American film, he doesn't come good and get the girl at the prom at the end. He he, he ends up he ends up raising the dead. So it's it's, yeah. a, it's it's different in that sense. So it feels like there was a little, kind of a mini serious bit when they added some depth to the characters, um, rather than it just being this. Could they could have started with young necromancer or lich or something? Can they? But I like the way they 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 kind of built that and added mm. a little bit of, of depth into the story. I say they, um, um, Charles Davidson. But um, yeah. other than that, the story was fairly straightforward. I feel that there was the, I suppose it was implied that his activities had had somehow killed off the the fish in the seas to the north, and that's why the raiders were there. So his him dabbling with necromancy has caused this raid in the first place so again mm. maybe he was a useless child he shouldn't have been <laughs> messing around with things oh, it was me feeling i don't know i felt a little bit sorry for it not just because of his outcome at the end but mm. also because he's um he felt like he's obviously not a natural fisherman and he wasn't in the yeah. place 
he should be in his life and because of that idle hands and all the <laughs> and all the rest and uh and look what happened um but I, I liked it it seemed pretty straightforward um it could be in any setting not necessarily warhammerish but again that's also warhammer's a pretty standard fantasy world in in in, in many ways especially in this era Mm. Um, it wasn't as well defined as it as as it is now in many ways, and especially with the how Warhammer's changed. That's why we have all the the changes with AOS to really cement that IP. At this period, even when I grew up playing it, it felt very much like a, a one of a many fantasy worlds. Yeah. Um, and the big difference, the big standout change, was probably chaos and the way that was handled, and that's grown more over the years. But yeah. in terms of dealing with necromancers, liches, and Norse raiders, it, it could be could be anywhere couldn't it yeah and, and so there's a few a few points I, t- I really agree with i think there's a great shout there about the almost the kitchen sink drama aspect of it where mm-hmm. you do spend some time with his parents and you do get a perspective because like you say you didn't necessarily there, there are versions of this story that wouldn't have that that would have just been okay he's up there doing his necromancy the norse arrive and they take out the village uh, yeah and we find out his parents are dead and the sadness is just the very fact that they're his parents, I guess. But because we do get to spend a little bit of time with them, it does turn them into more rounded characters, and you do get to find out a little bit, a little bit of the family drama, why he has ended up doing what he's doing, potentially, and what's sort of driven mm-hmm. in that direction. But then also that they were sort of maybe doing their best, and they just didn't understand him. And like you say, I think that's a really good shout about it being relevant to the audience likely to be reading it at the time that sort of you know maybe there were some disaffected teens and that does come up again and again actually the, the teenage protagonist throughout these stories mm-hmm. presumably because that is who they were trying to sell the books to but yeah i think there's definitely something there and I, yeah you maybe do feel a little bit sorry for him but there is <laughs> there is his decisions aren't great and the consequences are pretty significant as a result right yes yes yeah <laughs> yeah, there's, there's, there's there's been introverted, and then, and then there's atrocities related to yeah. it. Isn't there? there are different levels. There's no, there's no excuse for his dabbling. He was still doing something evil within the world mm. of Warhammer, and something I he quite, knew was wrong. Clearly, yeah. knew it was wrong. And I like that that twist though of you because you get the sense, at least I did when I first read it, that the Norse raiders, it felt like they were just random raiders and they, this was a fishing village that just got randomly targeted but then at some point you do discover that there is a reason and it is tied to that whatever's happened to the fish and whether that is the necromantic powers that have caused it so he has enacted he's caused this event to take place as opposed yeah. to the norse guys being just straight up bad guys and they are still bad guys because they do still slaughter an entire defenseless village but they were at least doing it because they thought there was something evil there. Mm-hmm. And then well, that almost makes it less Warhammer and more history. Well, I think the way, well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> the way they go about it, you know, is pretty, yeah. they're pretty full on. They don't, they don't come and ask questions and they're like, guys, can we work together to solve this problem? They're straight in with the axes. <laughs> I don't is... think they ask many questions at Lindisfarne. <laughs> in, uh, <laughs> when the fuck is... so, but but what I'm, that's the, the point I'm making there is, is that I, I think that by adding the reason for it and the, maybe they were starving, you know, that their, or their perceived reason for it yeah. within their limited um, worldview, they thought that they were doing, doing the right thing. Yeah. So of course it's not a good thing. Um, but where does the evil really exist within that kind of world? And as I say, it just it seems to have you, you could draw, you could you remove the necromancy from that, and you you could tell a, a story from yeah. from from well, you're not supposed to say dark ages anymore. I think historians don't use that term, but if I say dark ages more people probably know what I'm, what I'm talking cool. about, but it's like a Viking raid, isn't it? It's yeah, uh, raiding an Anglo-Saxon village is something that's that could quite easily be believable. But then actually um, you've got the maybe that this ties it more closely to Geheimnisnacht, where you've got like because again, Gotrek is doing what he thinks is the right thing and he's using mm-hmm. his violent methods to achieve it. That's what these guys are doing. Um yeah. the only person so far who's well, I suppose the chaos cultists in the first story, in this case, Helmut Kurza, the the boy who's who's getting involved with the necromancy and the lich thing. But then as we'll see actually later on, necromancy is still is not quite as bad as as all that it seems 
in this version of the Warhammer world. And I know there, there's a lot of stuff in the lore around the Wizards War and they're expunging all of the, eradicating all the necromancers and the wizards and all that sort of stuff from the Empire. But there's a few stories here where people aren't as down on necromancy as you might expect, I think. So, yes, yes. I mean, you know, there's a certain, <laughs> you know, the ne- the guy next door might be a necromancer. He's a bit weird. He, he might be a necromancer, but, you know, he's just, just keep leaving to himself. Sort he of only like. uses him as a cleaner. It's <laughs> fine. <isn't> it? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, the lich, though, who who is doing this deal with Helmet is, is, is a bad guy, it seems. And there's yeah. definitely is going to be taking advantage. And the end of the story is very much a, a sort of note of, okay, actually, Helmut Kurzer might have gotten in deeper than he thought. Uh, yes. And, and is he either going to be possessed or killed in some way? Or basically, is his life over? And I think that ties back to the first line, because the, the very first line of the story is that he has he basically has realized he's going to die as soon as he sees the ships on the horizon. And the assumption mm-hmm. from the reader, I think, is that, oh, the ships are going to be what gets him. But it's not. It's this hidden evil that's going to get him, in fact. And did he realize at that point which it would be? I don't I think wonder. he did. No, I think he, he no. thinks it's the ship. And maybe he yeah. thinks that actually he's going to get away with it now because he's got the power of this lich. But then actually, no, he isn't going to get away with it because he's started the ball rolling on his own death. And do you think the lich... Was the reason the, the proximity of the, of the lich? Do you think the lich was already working at a character that they mm. knew was weak and susceptible, or is it just a big coincidence that he was dabbling with necromancy, with you know, raising squirrels or whatever it was he was doing, sure. and then he ha- happened to know about this 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 um, tomb that he could go to, and because uh, he seemed like he knew what he was doing, but was he being led there? There's a, I haven't got it in front of me. There's a scene when he was being spoken to is almost like he was mentioned being in a dream or something in a mm. dream state and he, and he didn't really have any control over yeah. the conversation and it makes you wonder whether the lich was already exerting some control over him before it happened it'd have to be right i mean that's all that this that's so. the classic version of this sort of tale is that yeah you're drawn to it because of the the power emanating whether or not it's that as directly as someone giving you visions or a voice in your head or it's just a sense that you know I should go up to the graveyard and and hang out because it feels <laughs> right, like that kind of thing. But yeah, I mean, I hadn't really thought. But yeah, maybe the lich is is being more actively corrupting him for a longer period of time, potentially. I mean, that's and mm-hmm. that's classic Warhammer, in fact, isn't it? Of just like corruption slowly, like working its way through people's souls and and, and just and the world itself is just slowly being corrupted over time. It's- it's all about the corruption of the weak and the greedy, isn't it? It's there's there's, there's, there's very little <laughs> else yeah. than that in terms of people's motivations. They're either outright evil to start with, or they're weak, or they're greedy, and it kind of falls into one of those one of those brackets. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of consequences to actions, and the consequences are quite quick and quite brutal, oftentimes. Mm. Yeah, although yeah, there's there's some there's some stories where it's not always quite as. Uh, instantaneous as you might think i think it's interesting the so this was written by charles davidson but that's the pseudonym of charles stross and the mm. there's quite a few authors in this collection and in, in all of gw books in fact who use pseudonyms are they all to, pseudonyms in this apart from bill not king? all of them i think nicola griffith and and bill king um and and Steve Baxter is Stephen Baxter, so he's not that oh, far that's, away. That's, it's, yeah, that's not. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, there's there there, there is a, a fair few pseudonyms. Uh, but Charles Stross has actually written. I mean, he's written loads and loads of other stuff. But one of the things he he wrote was uh, Atrocity Archives, which is a almost like Delta Green. If you're familiar with that, it's kind of takes a bit of Lovecraftian lore and then puts it alongside like the Secret Service and British intelligence and that kind of stuff. Uh, okay. And they've, they made a, an RPG of it called The uh, the Laundry, because uh, the, the Laundry Files was the name of the series. But I think that that's interesting that the author's got this Lovecraftian form. He goes on to write a lot of stuff that's kind of drawing on Lovecraftian kind of ideas. Because there's a bit of that here as well, of the sort of you know the curious mind and inquiring into, into certain stuff. And as soon as you open that door, you have damned yourself. You know, you read mm-hmm. that book or you speak those words, you have basically 
you know, signed up to unknowable horror taking over yourself. Um, so, yeah, there's certainly something there. It's interesting, I think. Fantastic. What, what, one, I mean, I, there's, I think you were right as well when you said that it's not necessarily that warhammery on the face of it. I mean, in fact, mm -hmm. Jim, Jim Ball in, in the Patreon discussion said that it's not as instantly Warhammer in a recognizable way. And I think that's fair to say because mm -hmm. it, it, it does take place in a relatively generic corner of the Warhammer world. And you don't necessarily learn a lot about the Warhammer world from it. Because all this, like you say as well, it could be a historical setting for the most part, if, it, if not for the magical stuff. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if the themes maybe get it closer to being a more Warhammer-y story. And that yes. the corruption and stuff. But if it's yeah, not I quite there. I, yeah, I think it works because you don't always have to have the really sort of headlining Warhammer stuff. That doesn't mean it doesn't, doesn't make it not a, a Warhammer story as such. But because those things are missing, um, I, I think it's an era thing. I think it's because we're, we're in the modern era when we think Warhammer, we're thinking of races and things beyond chaos all the time. And because chaos is, chaos is a lot more subtle and grey here, and even the the, the necromancy is, is, is common in all fantasy because you haven't got green skins talking about the boys and stuff like that in these stories. It, yeah, you, you, of course you could take these stories and place it in, in, in another area. If you don't have any place names that are recognisable, any any characters that are already recognisable, Gottfried and Felix obviously already were, uh, so you, you your mind automatically goes there. Hmm. I wonder if you change the names of those characters, um, whether, and you hadn't read Gottfried and Felix, whether you, sure. you feel the same about that as well. I don't, I, I don't know how we're conditioned. That's but, a really uh, good point, actually, yeah, because if this wasn't Helmet, Kurzer, this was uh, like Heinrich Kemmler. Yes, yeah, uh, you know, or the lich a young one. Heinrich Kemmler as a yeah, as a... or if it, if the if the lich was Nagash or the Dread King or, or you know it was someone more recognizable. Yes, I think that's a fair point actually. Yeah, maybe maybe I'm just I want the the cameos left, right, and center. I want all of that sort of <laughs> stuff. But no, I think that you're right. It, it that is maybe me taking a more modern perspective of having having read so much lore and other stories set in these in the Warhammer world for 40 odd years now there is a very clear definition and a, and a real rich fabric to that at the time well this is just what a random story about a random necromantic kid <laughs> I was just going to say I played fantasy role play in this era and that would have been Warhammer because right. back then that's what War, Warhammer would have been recognizable as to me. So mm. there's that I think again, I think it's that kind of you identify with with more the IP over time mm. um that uh, you, you kind of changes your perspective on it. So it's not not Warhammer, but it's not instantly recognizable. So you yeah. always need to be told it's a Warhammer story. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. And I think it's it's a good follow-up to Geheimnis Nacht because it's different and yeah, you, as you said at the top it is more straightforward in a way but it's telling a completely different story it's giving you a different place a different feel there's no gags yeah it's, it's kind of it's tone, a kind yeah. of dull and dark and depressing um, yeah I mean did you enjoy it overall this one I did I did yes yeah, yeah I think um, I don't I think it was good, good as a short story I didn't go on thinking oh there was more i think it worked sure. as, a, as a as a relatively short short story as well yeah and it was just a nice little snippet tale that get you give you a picture a snapshot of of different areas within this warhammer world as it was at the time mm. um so i did enjoy it yeah it wasn't something i'd think oh god that was a bit weird it didn't take me out of the warhammer aesthetic which i was put into with the first story i still sure. feel like yeah we're here we're in we're in late 80s early 90s warhammer still yeah i did feel like it yeah, no, me too. I enjoyed it as well. And it's right when you say it's one of the shorter stories in the book. I think this this and Apprentice Look are actually the two equally shortest at just 19 pages. So they are much more succinct in their in their storytelling. And they probably are the two that are the most straightforward. And we'll get into Apprentice Look in a in a little bit. But yeah, I think it was fun. I thought it was a good story that told a different 
it gave us a different window into just what might be happening one random night in the Warhammer yes. world. Yeah. Okay, let's move on then to another story. This is The Other by Nicola Griffith. This is one that, when I was discussing it, had a lot of, there's a load of people really enjoyed this one. And I think this is quite a popular story because there's quite a lot of depth to it, I think. So this is the story of a young apprentice doctor called Stefan who meets a mysterious stranger called Katya, who they are on their way. He's on the way with his father into Middenheim. There is an upturned cart. There's been an accident. Someone is injured. He and his father, they're both doctors. They go to try and step in and help. And this mysterious woman, Katya, is already tending to the injured. It turns out she doesn't have a license. So she sort of goes on her way. There's a bit of a vibe of, you know, you the, 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 the very the nature of the constrictive world of Middenheim and the Empire, and you have to have a license to be a doctor. And actually being a doctor just means you can charge people for medical care. And if you don't have any money, you're just going to get sent to the temple and maybe you'll get some help. And and she's kind of upset in that order a little bit. But then once Stefan, the younger doctor, gets his license, he goes out to celebrate. He goes to an inn called the Red Moon where he sees Katya again. And this time she's singing and she tells a tale in her song of someone who encounters a small stone that they think it might be something else but actually turns out to be warp stone and it gets heated over the fire and explodes and embeds in her arm and that bit of warp stone then corrupts her arm and mutates it and then she gets possessed by chaos and ends up burning down the house with her in it from that stefan becomes kind of a little bit obsessed with katia and sort of stalks her a little bit follows her around discovers that she's helping the poor people of middenheim with their medical care, who may or may not themselves be mutants. There's kind of a bit of a question mark over that. And Stefan is in a weird place about this. He's not comfortable with it. But then he gets super jealous because he finds out that Katya is spending some time with the deputy high wizard, Yana Everhauer, and he thinks there's something romantic maybe going on there. It actually turns out that the story that Katya sold it, told in her song was true and it was her who was affected and it was her leg, not her arm, and she's been covering it up. And the Deputy High Wizard, with Stefan's help, can cure her from this chaotic mutation and this sort of effect that's that's starting to take her over. And there's kind of a question mark over whether he's going to do it or not. He does. He becomes a better person as a result of the events of the story and he kind of sends her on her way to go and help the poor people and he himself says you know what i'm gonna go and instead of being a doctor who charges people i'm gonna go and work at the temple and be a a better person so there's a lot in this story i've probably not done it justice in that summary because it's much more there's there's a, a richness and a depth i think to the story as well but how did you feel about this one I really enjoyed it. It's very different. Mm. Um, and it was uh, all the way through. I didn't know what was going to happen or what to expect, which is obviously a mark of a good story. You kind of, you can kind of guess where the Gotrick and Felix kind of story. And you, it was very easy early on. As soon as you worked out this uh, young necromancer was a necromancer, you knew what was going to happen there. Whereas this honestly didn't know. You expected there was going to be, the terror almost telegraph twist that she was going to be a mutant, but there was enough doubt in his mind that maybe it was all about him. And there was definitely a lot about his insecurities as, as a young surgeon, the way he felt about himself and sort of reflecting on the way that she treated him. She made him almost seem boyish and churlish. Um, you know, he was obviously a wealthy man throwing his money around at the bar and she was poor, but he was attracted to it. So there's lots of complications there. So mm. there was always a chance that could be a twist here. And it's, it's, it's not that it's not her at all. It's someone else. Um, but yeah, I really enjoyed it. It's one I would have you know, been happy for it to be longer. Um, it felt like it ended fairly abruptly, but again, that's uh, the nature of a short story, I suppose. Um, I think it was quite interesting that uh, the 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 wizard 
played such a background part in it really it was very much about his thoughts as a, as a surgeon but you, i'm surprised the surgeon could do much really and maybe that's the way <laughs> war has changed that uh removing a bit of warp stone um i you'd have guessed that well that's not going to do anything but it, it seems to suggest that it maybe did work yeah. i don't know i think um, yeah but um, i quite like that that there was this weird interaction where in order to save Katya and stop this mutation from taking root, it was you need a you need someone to do the sort of surgical procedure at the same time as you need someone to do whatever the the sorceress procedure is. Yes. I, I do, yeah, I'm sure there's there's no real like it doesn't really make a lot of sense, but there's also something quite fun to me about that conceptually that it takes both the physical and the magical mm. in order yeah, it's to not that it doesn't work because it, it clearly does work mm. but you just you, i don't you don't see many warhammer stories go down that that route do you yeah it's not so, many at so all i quite like i quite liked it mm. i like that there's there's you know there's no fighting or implication of fighting in it at all really it's not a story in, in that sense it's mm. it doesn't feel so much like something you might do on a on a on a, on a role play evening um, it might be a side quest. It's not a main, it's not something, it might be something, I don't know if I, I haven't role played for years, but occasionally myself, when I was younger, my best friend, it'd just be the two of us and we'd run small adventures for each other. And they might be more like this because you're mm. interacting with other characters and it's more about the conversations and the problem solving, the puzzle solving, rather than the kind of the group get together and the fighting. So in that sense, it, mm. it feels more like, exploring that kind of avenue as a story rather than than another way but i i yeah it's hard to kind of go too deep into it because there's more questions i think about what, what what the world would be like and what they did afterwards for me it's um as soon as you know the secret it takes away any further mystery in some ways i think yeah i mean i think it's it's i enjoyed it as well i, I think it is a good one because it does have it feels more literary if I can, if I don't mm -hmm. know if, I, <laughs> if that's the right term for what I mean here. But yeah, it, it feels more like an exploration of character, an exploration of certain themes, and kind of using the fact that you have this fantasy setting and this idea of chaos to explore some other stuff. And and it's not the you know maybe it's unfair to say, but the surface level stuff you might have seen in like the reavers and the dead which i think there is more subtext in that than we probably got into but not as much as there is here in this yeah. particular story because you do you you kind of have and there was a real good debate we had about what who is the other what is the other in this story what does the title refer to is it the mutants is it the poor is it stefan himself because mm -hmm. maybe he he can't he has no compassion. He has no sympathy for anybody else. So he's sort of othered everyone, and that therefore has othered him. He doesn't even get on with his father, and like he, he doesn't want to be a doctor. He doesn't care about that relationship. He's kind of got a bit of a a difficult, strained relationship with his father, the doctor, whether it's jealousy or or what have you. So yeah, you kind of have this interesting question there, and then there's all the other things within the text as well. So we we get the the sort of general sense that stefan is jealous that maybe katya and the deputy high wizard who's a woman as well that they might be having some kind of affair and i mean one thing that i really liked is that that's unremarked upon that's just mm -hmm. totally fine that's not even an issue and i think that's great the issue for stefan is that he's jealous because he wants to be having the relationship so there's these kinds of things as well. There's other sort of aspects to it I think are really super interesting. I agree once you then know, because you also can guess early on that the song about the woman who's been infected by the stone and the, the warp stone and the chaos mutation, it seems pretty obvious that that is going to turn out to be Katya. Yes. So there's you, you sort of dissipate a little bit of that tension when you find that out. But because that's not really what the story's about, the story's about Stefan and 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 his relationship with chaos, his relationship with poor people and 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 helping people and these other aspects. It didn't it didn't sort of end the story for me. There was still more interesting stuff to explore, I thought. Mm-hmm. 
yeah i suppose it's those things are resolved but on a very kind of top layer level aren't they so yes he goes off and uh has a reformed career maybe <laughs> as working in the poor houses but who knows he might have got bored of that after six months and uh gone back to making some money again there's the that's interesting and i it's something i not talked about earlier is about the way the 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 the, the mutated or treated uh, is it is it an illness is it an affliction can you mm. still offer them kindness does that mean they're evil um or are they just mutate it is it, a, is it is it no more than a deformity so that comes up quite a lot and again that, that makes me think of lepers in the in in the, in the dark ages mm. people that were ill how you how do you treat plague victims do you, you lock them off so it feels very medieval in that sense um and then i suppose you've got the the health care for all question or not haven't you around the way that uh that, that katia was was upset the way that the injured man was treated to begin with she wanted to keep him still and, and and treat him there and they wanted to move him because if they treated him there and he didn't have the money to pay them then they wouldn't have their money or at least mm. if they went to the the temple and he'd found out they did have money he someone could be sent so he could be sent back to their offices and that was that was a very um you know the, the politics of of middenheim at the time mm. um and yeah, it's, it's so so that yeah, there's lots of avenues to talk about with those kind of things, and I think that uh, definitely that sort of thing. That's where you, uh, way I imagine the the Warhammer world to be. It's not a it's not a place to be poor and meek. Sure. It's, it's, yeah, uh, um, yeah. I so, mean, yeah, you do get the sense that if you have a, an accident at work and and you know you you break your leg or something, that's probably, there's no injury lawyers yeah, for you. Exactly. No, so. you're not, not going to be in a good spot. But yeah, I, I think you're right. <laughs> It is quite a neat ending, right? He does, Stefan does turn around and, and sort of just, not quite out of nowhere, but it is a very a very quick and complete turnaround to be, oh, no, actually, I'm going to give up everything I thought I was going to do, and now I'm going to be a good guy at the end. Maybe that could have been explored a little bit more. Maybe if this was a, a, a fuller length novel or a story. It's interesting as well, because Nicola Griffith actually has continue to write and has since come back to these characters, Katia in particular, and okay. has done a deal with Games Workshop or been given permission by Games Workshop to continue writing and exploring the character with a lot of the sort of Warhammer aspects removed from any further story. Interesting. Yeah, interesting. so I think that it, it is quite interesting, I think, as well, that, that as an author, she's still thinking about this character and still wants to explore this this character and her story and i'm not too surprised by that because i think that there is a lot to explore here and maybe the 20 pages of this story didn't really give enough space to get as deep as as one might want but i think that she does a fantastic job here of telling an interesting story a very different story to the rest of the collection and a very different story to most warhammer fiction i think really Mm -hmm. I mean, Katia would be the character that I'd be interested in, in learning more about. You'd feel like she'd have a more interesting life to move on to. As much as Stefan maybe evolves a little bit and grows as a character, he still feels like he's a bit wet behind the ears and, mm -hmm. and maybe his reaction still to, to the to her is is that kind of unrequited love. He's had a had an event in his life that's changed him a bit. But um, you know, will it I'm not too interested in finding out what he goes on. It's a bit of a backstory for him, maybe. Yeah. But Katia, yeah, you could see her. She seemed a very confident, strong character. And it's she's very... It would be nice to see how a character like that could develop based on that experience that she's had. So I can imagine her being a... Well, lots of things, to be honest with you. You could quite Agreed. easily yeah. weave her into many different story types. So it'd be interesting to see what she does with it. Yeah. So this was... Uh, so the other was the first of two stories in this collection that was set in Middenheim. The next one in the collection is Apprentice Look by Sean Flynn, and that's also set there. And this is a very different story, I think, to, to the other and to, to the previous stories, really. So this one tells the tale of Carl Spielbrunner, who is an apprentice bookseller who doesn't enjoy his life. So there's a common theme there, I think, across some of these protagonists. He wants to get out of the bookselling game, and that opportunity comes up 
when someone brings in a magical tome, his boss is out, so he buys this and he's basically going to sell it on for a lot of profit, he thinks. He finds in the spine of this book a little map, which he takes a look at and he memorizes, and then a creepy wizard, who may or may not be a necromancer who lives up the street, comes into the <laughs> store and asks about the book. And Carl, because he wants to sell it and make the profit for himself, he says, I don't know anything about it. You have to come back and talk to the boss. That night, the wizard comes back and Carl escapes with the book out the back door because he doesn't want the wizard to take the book off of him, where he encounters a handsome young warrior who speaks in a really weird way and calls himself Argo. And in the space of one interaction, Carl agrees to go with Argo into the caverns beneath Middenheim using the map that he found in the in the magic book to evade all of the traps and to find some treasure that's not clear what treasure it is at the very heart of this dungeon, essentially. So they go mm -hmm. off on this quest. They have to find their way into the caverns, which they go through a dodgy pub called the Drowned Rat. Uh, and then they get access to it and they go off on this quest. And it basically is a quest. They go, they encounter marauding mobs of goblins and then some skeletons and there's traps and all this sort of stuff. But as they get to the final room, Argo turns around and betrays Carl and he's going to kill him because actually he's a bad guy, it turns out. But the wizard steps in and saves the day. And that's when we find out the, the treasure is actually the lost library of Fistora Sprats, a long dead dwarf wizard, and that Carl is going to become the creepy wizard's new apprentice. So yes. that is the story that we get here, a dungeon crawling quest. How did you find this one, Stu? Um, least favorite so far, I think. Right. Um, it was, um, it's, it's charming in its own way. It was a very simple, linear story. Again, very recognizable to an evening around a table with with dice. Though it, because the story, I think, was a little less nuanced. It did feel a little bit less. If behind this actor's role play, this was more hero quest, isn't it? In terms of its depth <laughs> of story, um, but um, I didn't hate it. It's not something I would sort of return to with vigor, but it does a nice job of of telling a, a little story about a, how you know a magic book, and it might give people inspiration for gaming nights and things like that which i think well a lot of these a lot of these stories were um yeah the characters were pretty vague I suppose you didn't really spend i mean argo's naturally vague because you, you're not supposed to know secrets about him so it's very hard to develop that as a character anyway the wizard we don't know anything about him really because he kind of turns up three times um and and that's he's supposed to be secretive um and carl you you know the most about but he still does some you know, acts pretty bizarrely um, very quickly. <laughs> having this book, thinking I'm going to make some money out of it, to finding out what it is and still thinking, oh, can I still try and make some money out of it? It seems that at that point you'd be like, you have the book, I want to live kind of thing. But he, he clearly <laughs> hates his life that much. So it's, that's a bit, I suppose, 80s movie almost-esque of the, yes, the unbelievable um, you, no one in their right mind would do this, but then if we stopped it here, it wouldn't be a story. So we're going to do it. Going to do it anyway. Um, so he's quite plucky in that sense, I suppose, isn't he? <laughs> that he's almost finds some that finds the bravery of a, almost a, a child would have in an eighties movie. Um, but um, I liked it. It was in that sense. I liked it. It was easy. It was an easy read. Um, there's, there's a few bits that sort of took me out of the story. If not, I wasn't that deep in the story. Anyway, <laughs> a few bits that took me out. There was we described it was a bloody nose as rich and as hot as fresh gravy. I mean, that, that seemed <laughs> just. I've never heard blood described as <laughs> fresh gravy. I know this was the era of Bisto adverts on the on the television all the time, so maybe. Maybe uh, the author was watching that, but it it is a couple of just little little bits like that. But it's fun. I mean, the old Chrome was called Scabby Elsa, you know. <laughs> it's 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 amusing in that sense. Um, I like this I, one. I did so you? I, yeah, I did, and I I surprised myself, and especially when you boil it down and sort of just in retrospect look take a look at it. It it's so simple and also pretty 
silly because you're right. The, there's so many points at which you're just, why would Carl continue to be involved in any of this? Especially even early on when he gets the book and he's his initial plan, right, I'm going to sell the book and make a lot of money. Oh, wait, the book is actually bound in human flesh. Skin. <laughs> and, he, <laughs> and instead of going... You know what? I'm going to get rid of this as quick as possible. He's still, it doesn't change his plan at all. He's like, oh, that might make it worth more, <laughs> which is bizarre. What I thought, <laughs> despite that, I think you're dead right when you say it's, it is Hero Quest. This is just a dungeon crawl in its simplest sense. It's an, The book, I think, is an interesting setup. Mm-hmm. But that's not really, I don't think, what the author is interested in. They they just want to get him into the dungeon to go on the quest. Now, perhaps that could have been a bit more elegantly done. But I think that the fact it is just a straight up quest and they've been flipping the cards and okay, the first encounter is a load of goblins and the second encounter is a a, a spike trap or pit trap or something. I quite enjoyed that because it just fired those little nostalgia neurons in my brain of like, yeah, I'm, I'm playing Hero Quest like by proxy. This is great. Um, mm-hmm. There were some cool details in there as well. I thought so. There was the actual the 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 book itself having been found at the bottom of the cliff of size in Middenheim by the crone Scabielsa because. Argo, our ultimate villain, turns out to have pursued the original apprentice of the wizard who was trying yes. to evade him and get away and has got the book and basically decides to leap off of the cliff in order to protect the book and keep it away from Argo. I thought that was a, a very good sort of setup. And then to have the book find its way to Carl, that's quite nice. And then the other detail that I really, really like is Argo himself being, he's an undead creature but he's not just a skeleton or a zombie he's actually like oogie boogie from uh, nightmare before christmas he's like a bundle of of flies and and creepy crawlies inside of argo's skin if you like yes. and he's still got almost the- like something from the mummy yes yeah, yeah kind of- <laughs> absolutely yeah and it's 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 creepy there's a great visual by martin mckenna of it and and it's just he is that is a good villain. I think he's probably telegraphed a bit too strongly. So when he talks throughout the course of the story, he refers to himself as Uz, and he has a buzzing voice and his breath smells like crushed ants and things like this. So What's maybe... crushed ants? <laughs> I don't know. I remember reading that thing. <laughs> <laughs> so that's probably, it's not like the best laid out surprise, but when you get there, I think it's a cool idea. At yeah. least, yeah. I think. Um, I wonder if they if they'd added the backstory as almost like a prologue to it, with the rushing away from the trying to get away from this impending foe and mm. making that leap at the beginning. And you know that the book's left there at the bottom, and then it cuts to the crone bringing the book in. The 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 jeopardy, the the power behind that book may have seemed more in the first place, and wouldn't have made it quite as kind of. I don't know, it brought some impending doom there rather than trying to find it out drip bit by bit by bit. You might yeah. have been a little bit more suspicious of Argo because when we first encountered Argo, I I wasn't, I thought, yeah, he's probably a bad guy, but you never know. This could be an Aragorn kind of character, mm-hmm. you know, behind his hood, and he could actually be there trying to help save him from the necromancer. And I think that's what you're trying to be led to believe that maybe mm-hmm. he's the good guy and the necromancer is the bad guy. But I think if you bought, you know, you could have installed that jeopardy the other way around if you were filming it you would you would probably sure. have a scene when the when the, the the first apprentice was being pursued petrified then he decides to either slips or he decides to take his own life and that book's left and then it cuts that's the almost scene. i think that's an int- that sparks an interesting thought because in retrospect i think that apprentice rather than carl is probably in some ways a more interesting protagonist because the the, the the sacrifice that that apprentice does commits to to sacrifice himself in order to save this book because they truly believe in the wizard, they truly believe in in protecting people and the magic and all that sort of stuff. That's a a noble, interesting character. Carl's maybe not maybe <laughs> yeah, he's certainly not, and because he's quite self, you know he wants to be 
something greater than himself. He dreams about being a captain of the watch. He obviously under he goes on this quest precisely because he wants to be a hero on a quest, even though he doesn't really know what that means. So he the the title Apprentice Look it 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 works because he gets to be apprentice not because he deserves it, but because he's lucky that the other guy isn't around anymore who did deserve it. And he just goes on this weird thing. The the other, the other thought that just just comes to mind is that the this is classic fantasy wizard. There's a Gandalfian aspect to, the, to this wizard, or even a, a sort of Dumbledore of if he was just straight up and just said what was going on and was like, "Listen, here's why it's dangerous. Here's what you can do to help me." Uh, you know, and uh, instead he he acts in a real creepy way, and he's just like really <laughs> superior, and he's kind of I don't think he speaks in riddles, but you kind of get that feel about him. When he could, he could just cut through all of that and just be like, you know, listen, this is why I need your help. It's a shame. Yeah, true. But if I can, it would have been a, a very short. Story. It would have been a short story. Yeah, no, that's true. <laughs> this book does have. So I, I I like to keep a, a little track of the taverns and inns and hostelries that we see across these stories because I think there's always some good names. I mean, I think in Gotrek and Felix, it's the Standing Stone Inn. We had the Red Moon in the other. In this one, there are two. There's the Drowned Rat, which is the sort of shady kind of gangster inn. And then there's also the Wolf's Grip, which is where Carl's boss likes to go and get drunk during the workday. And I just quite like that name, the Wolf's Grip. It's just, I don't know. I don't know what it means, really, but I, I like it. I think it's good. That's quite a cool thing to do, start collecting those. Well, uh, It's basically so that I can rob them for for when I run. For role-play games. Rob. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Okay. So the next story, A Gardener in Paravon by Brian Craig. In this one, we are getting a tale recounted by Philip LaBelle of his youth in the Bretonian city of Paravon. And he's talking about his young friend, Armand Carrier who became obsessed with the contents of his neighbor's garden. So this garden had high hedges, couldn't quite see into it. It didn't get a lot of light, but he noticed that birds would constantly flock and fly into the garden and then wouldn't come back out, or at least not many of them would come back out. So Armand ends up climbing onto his own roof. He's trying to get a better angle. He's constantly reading about it and looking for, for some way into the garden. He gets seen doing this by the owner, by the neighbor, uh, Gaspard Grier, who invites Philip and Armand over to see what's in the garden. When they go in, they find this odd sort of trellis that's been built that's got some really weirdly shaped, phallic shaped plants on it that actually eat the birds. So their roots grab the birds and then they consume them. Philip and Armand take this quite well. <laughs> Gaspard Grier, the, the neighbor, just lets them go on their way. But Armand has a really weird dream about a sort of chaotic kind of demon-looking creature that kind of flies and picks him up and takes him out of the window, deposits him in the garden. He then wakes up, tells Philip about it. Philip's just not that interested, I guess. It's just a dream. Don't worry about it. But the next night, presumably the same thing has happened again. But this time, Armand is found on the floor outside his window, having died from a fall, it seems like. Philip tells everybody about this dream that he'd been having, tells everybody about the neighbor and what they saw there and these weird plants that eat birds. And everybody just says, no, it's probably that Armand was was a bit crazy. He liked to read weird stories and he maybe these dreams were just an indicator that he was going to throw himself out of a window. And that's kind of the end of the story. It's, it's a, it's an odd, it's an odd one, I think, isn't it? What, what was your initial yeah. reaction to this? It's, it's odd. It's um again, feels the flow seems sort of, I don't know, trying to find the right words to describe it. It seems quite slow paced and, and steady, even with the more um, unusual, parts of it they don't really seem to there's no kind of pick up in pace or, or jeopardy to the story you almost feel like it's well it, it's, mm. it's a tale that someone's reminiscing over isn't it rather than the others are stories within the time almost but it feels um it, it feels like a filler almost like a little kind of interlude before we move on to a longer story 
um, look at what chaos can be maybe within this world. It seems odd. Um, and but most part of it, it's, it's, it's okay. It's just, just some very strange parts in it. You, you know, so you alluded to the, the plants and the shape of the plants, the phallic symbol plants. And some of it's quite cool. I think it almost, um, there's a, Birds are sort of trapped in the plants and almost being ingested. So it's almost like alien meets the day of the trifis. Mm. It's kind of this really it's a very strange reference, and not many people will get that. But <laughs> it's um it's very that's odd, and I quite like that. And it's almost, you know, this is chaos is is clearly different in this story than it is in, in modern day fantasy. Um, there are bits where I just don't know why the the, they went there well, the author went there the, the, the there's a there's a there's a scene i suppose where he gaspar grullier is encouraging both armand and philippe to taste the juice from the end of these phallic plants mm. and uh, philippe does and it's a sweet tasting um sorry armand does sorry and then philippe doesn't he says in, he doesn't feel comfortable tasting it and it's kind yeah. of you're reading this you're thinking yeah, you wouldn't put it in a book now, I suppose, um, aimed at this well, market. Yeah, I'm not saying you wouldn't put it in a book now. You wouldn't put it in a Warhammer book now. But sure. you're like, what are you doing? And it makes me wonder why that got through mm. the edits there. Because it's not that those few lines are not needed. I'm not offended by it. And I'm not sure, sure anyone would be. So don't I don't want anyone to misinterpret that. I just, it jar, I found it jarring because I found myself yeah. remembering that about the story because it's such a short story i remember that more than maybe some of the other parts that might be more interesting it's just an odd thing to put there um unless you have a reason for it but yeah. what is the reason for it and you yeah. can go down a real yeah. cul-de-sac trying to guess what the reason was and i'm not sure that's helpful <laughs> if yeah. that makes sense yeah i yeah it does make sense and i think I think I agree and, and maybe a hint of disagreement as well but so i agree in the sense that it it's quite a shocking moment because there's nothing up to that point that would lead you to it. I don't think they just out of nowhere. We've just all of a sudden got, Oh, and also amongst all of this other stuff that's happening, the plants are actually phallic as well. And we're also now going to, yeah, taste the sort of juices that are, that are coming from them. And there's a kind of, there's a weird sort of moment. I think this could potentially be the reason for it is that you get the sense that, this is almost the seduction of the youth and Gaspard Gruyere, this old man who's invited two young lads into his house is then going to put these kids at, at, in danger. And in this case, it's in danger of, of chaos, but not in an immediate physical way. And I think that's true yes. of the whole story. Because like you say, there isn't really a lot of tension to the story. There's a version of this, I think, that could have played out more like the the Tom Hanks movie The Burbs or uh, Rear Window yes. or Disturbia yeah. or any of those you know my neighbor's doing something weird I've clocked it they've seen me seeing them do it and now there's like a real okay is this going to now are they coming for me as a result of it whereas this story doesn't play out like that at all it's so quiet and sort of calm in it you do get a little bit of Armand kind of is like okay I'm a bit frustrated that I don't understand what's happening but then when both boys do encounter, they go and see the garden, they're then just like, oh, okay. <laughs> I guess we've seen yeah. it now. It's, it's, it's a weird garden, but yeah, yeah that's and a there's bit even weird. A, a point before that where Armand, who, who's like climbed up on his own roof in order to take a look, because he's, he's gone to some extreme lengths, but he basically is like, well, I think I'll just leave it now. Actually, I've, I'm, I'm going to, I'll never know, and I'm happy never knowing, I guess. And then... That's when Gaspard Gruyere invites them in. So you kind of get this, there's a sort of unusual low stakes pace to the whole thing. But because yes. because it's chaos and because it's Warhammer, that's, I think, the insidiousness of it is that, yeah, it is a slow burn. There's just a guy who lives down the road who is feeding birds to his plants and potentially yes. like doing something that's bringing these kind of de demonic entities these flying creatures into the world or keeping them safe or whatever his deal is he's doing that and not only does no one know even if they do know as they do at the end of the story no one cares and that's kind of i think the sort of insidiousness of it and i think that 
potentially you could say, okay, well, there's that is made its most explicit in terms of yeah. like the, the text through that moment when Gaspard is like, oh, why don't you boys sample this? This yes, thing? yeah, I feel like that could have been done in a in a, in could, a yeah, I mean, way that made done. it feel more Warhammer because it doesn't feel it almost feels like he's they, they've it's almost saying it's so strange in the way it's presented it's people are going to find allegory there aren't they they're going to be this creepy old man you've got yeah. all these different things yeah. that you just wouldn't go anywhere near in a fantasy novel aimed at potentially a lot of teenagers and, and these days yeah that's a fair feels, point yeah it feels as i said it's it, it made me chuckle i thought it was a strange <laughs> story it didn't feel very warhammer um because the I don't know the it feels like the interpretation of chaos it isn't anything recognizable so even that era where you've got your realm of chaos type books so that it's not even that kind of chaos is it there's there's not one element there I think that it's recognizable even Bretonia is not recognizable as the Bretonia we see in in, sure. in later editions as well. I know it was different in the, in the yeah in, in the earlier editions but I didn't dislike it. It's not something I'm desperate to go back and read again either. I just thought it was at the one so far was the most strange. Hmm. Um, it left me scratching my head of maybe not the most oh, strange. <laughs> I've got another candidate for so that. So far, so far, but yeah, so far for sure. Yeah, no, I know what you mean, and I think, yeah, is it? Do because actually one of the one of the uh, contributions to Patreon chat, uh, Ryan Speck was saying that the reason he disliked this story was because it doesn't really tell him anything about the Warhammer world at large. Like, you do, do you really learn anything about chaos? Do you really learn anything about Betonia? Do you really learn anything about the Warhammer world? And I've been reflecting on that. And I think, I think part of the issue is that Bretonia itself is so different in later versions of Warhammer than it was early on in the, mm. the sort of Warhammer story when it was a bit more just a, a sort of a, a version of medieval France and it it was corrupt and maybe there was a bit of decadence and a bit of like the chaos underneath in the similar-ish way to the Empire but just with a slightly different flavour you know and obviously they then leaned into all the Arthurian legends and all that sort of stuff so this version of Bretonia being one where the more important the most important things in a in a Bretonian city are that your garden is really nice and that you don't have any debts, you know, and that 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 makes you a good neighbor, basically. Uh, yeah. And it doesn't matter if you're feeding demons at night or or killing the the neighborhood kids, as long as you don't have any debts. So I think I think that tells you a little bit about Bretonia, but it's just a very different version of Bretonia to what we'll see later. And they they totally abandon I think that sort of conception of of Bretonia really. Yes, clearly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, an interesting story. Not my favorite, not my least favorite. It, I, I will be interested to see, because obviously this is written by Brian Craig, who is the, the pseudonym for uh, Brian Stableford, but he would go on to write one of the trilogies of the GW books, the Orpheo trilogy. He also wrote one of the Dark Future books as well. So we'll be seeing a lot more of his writing mm. as we go through. So I, I am interested in seeing where he goes next because it's well written this story oh oh yes it is it's, yeah, it's not yeah. kind of that's the thing it's got a it, prose of it's quite nice it's almost like a i don't know it's almost like they've serialized a long form poem mm. into a little sort of strange story that's what he that's maybe it's where some of his oddness comes from um but yeah it's just just a little a couple of little jarring parts shall we? Yeah. the best way of describing it but um yeah it will be interesting to see what he does when he's got to tell us like a, a story with a more traditional structure. Like I assume there will have to be through his Orpheo trilogy because, you know, that's a continuing yeah. uh, story of progression, although an interesting, and we'll get to it when we get to it, I suppose, but those stories are also stories being told to you by somebody about something else that's happening. So, cause that's an aspect of this tale that i find interesting because it doesn't really seem to do much like there's no reason that you couldn't have set this story just in paravon and it, and we are seeing the events happen to armand in real time as it were but we're not we're getting an older philip telling us mm -hmm. what happened and i'm not sure why yeah. that is 
uh, yeah, I, d- I don't know why. Because you don't get anything new from it by having it be a, a sort of tale that's already happened, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, absolutely makes sense. Absolutely. And maybe some of the elements to it would have felt more Warhammer if they were being told firsthand, so to speak. So Yeah, more immediacy to it. And you might also yeah. get more tension, I suppose, because we already know yeah. that Armand is, is, you know, something bad's going to happen to him because it already has. Yeah, you get the, he's, he's quite guessable quite early on. Yeah. <laughs> right. We are, we have arrived at the Starboat by Steve Baxter. Now, this is an interesting tale, I believe. So I will <laughs> quickly run through what I think this story was about, and then we can get into it. So a slant by the name of Coatser recruits a Norseman, Eric the Ware, to rob a map from a Kislewite city and to then join him on a journey deep into the chaos wastes to recover obsidian treasure from the heart of a crashed Slan spaceship. To accomplish this, they are going to use Coates's endless wealth and seemingly endless collection of mithril armor to build a tank that they call the Turtle, which has got all mod cons, and then they are going to ride in this completely enclosed tank with a team of war horses inside it through the Chaos Wastes in order to get to this crashed spaceship and then steal the stuff from within it. They do this, but then when they get there, Coatser touches something he shouldn't have. There's an explosion. He uh, loses an arm, and then that begins to mutate. The turtle is really knackered. Eric leads it back out of the Chaos Wastes, but it gets totally destroyed. All of the war horses get corrupted by Chaos, and Eric barely makes it out alive, having had to kill Coatser and escape with just about his life and a memento from the crashed spaceship. So that's the that's the broad overview of the story. But there seemed to be quite a lot in this one, I would say. So, <laughs> Stu, yeah. it's, did it's, you... It's, it's long, isn't it? It's long. It and felt long, yeah. I enjoyed it because I didn't know where this crazy tale was going to go next. So I wanted <laughs> to keep reading... And I was laughing quite a lot all the way through it. And when we talked before we started recording, I mentioned I just wrote some notes down and there put a few expletives. And uh, and <laughs> it's, it's it's just bizarre. Some of the bullet points I made, and that won't be the way I describe it now as a whole, but some of the bullet points I made. is So Coates was quite energetic and excitable at times. And I was just picturing Toad of Toad Hall, um, <laughs> the way he gets obsessed by a story people who don't know wind in the willows but he, he gets obsessed and he has to be controlled by people and there's eric and a um, ratty trying to control him and then he gets a car well if anyone knows wind of the willows um, to, to cause trouble in a car but it's just <laughs> it just i find it very hard to take him as a character seriously um and it was just as such a bizarre way to tell the story. I think the core idea of exploring the old law of the slan involvement in the, the sort of formation of the, the Warhammer world as we know it. I like that. That interests me. I know they kind of done away with most of that now and left it vague. Mm. I understand why. But I enjoyed that back then. I enjoyed the kind of crossover. So I don't, I'm not against any of that. Um but it seemed a weird way to tell the story. Why you need Coatser to be an ex-human who was magically changed into a slan by a <laughs> wizard? Why can't he just be a slan? Yeah. Um, so and why would this Bretonian peasant boy know have enough knowledge to know enough about slan to be able to act like a slan? It's just weird. Really, really weird. Yeah. Um, because that was one why of the details- have- that I left out of the little overview there is that Coats of the Slan is actually revealed to be a human who has done a deal with a wizard to be turned into a Slan. And as part of that deal, seemingly has gotten access to loads of Slan gold, loads of mithril from somewhere, and also this knowledge of the deep chaos wastes and where you can find this, this crashed spaceship. And he, he, as a Bretonian peasant boy, who he was before he was converted into this magical slam he'd studied some of these texts 
how on earth he got hold of those texts, I don't know. But yeah, so there's a, there's a few question marks around that, and I think you're right. Well, like, did did you need that to happen, or did you just need an extra couple of pages of story? So you were just like, well, what if this is the twist, and and we'll put something else in? And there's also earlier on something similar where Coatser has turned up to recruit Eric the Ware, and he says, "You are the Norseman who I need to complete this quest. I need you to come into the chaos wastes with me." He never has a specific reason why he needs Eric himself. No, he's but not. before we can go, you're going to have to go off on an adventure on your own to Kislev to steal the map for where we're going. So it's just this kind of odd, like, okay, well, I guess I'll go off on a quest on my own. And Eric does that. I actually really enjoyed that bit of the story. It it's good. It just doesn't yeah. make sense. <laughs> no, it's it's structurally <laughs> totally unnecessary for the for the the tale you're telling, which is supposed to be about Eric and Coates are on a sort of buddy cop adventure into the chaos wastes. But before we can do that, we've got to have Eric have an adventure on his own. So it's kind of a it's a weird choice, I think. But that that adventure he does have in Kislev, I thought was a, a well written bit of it's like a heist, and he goes up against yeah. a, a giant in order to break into the palace, and it was fun. It it works. I mean, if you'd started with Illustria, with the slam and some some what, I mean, what was around at that point, we don't. It was a limited Lisbon kind of. I can't remember what which actual beasts and things were around. But if you started there and we need to do this, we are going to go and kidnap some Norse slaves. And and then you befriend one of the slaves and they've got you could still have that good cop, bad cop kind of thing going on. They could have already had that map maybe cut mm -hmm. that little bit out, but they would maybe they would have had a little adventure on the way if it was a longer story. So you could still get the fight with the giant in. But it would have still been a strange story. <laughs> but I think it would have made a lot, lot more sense. Um, I did struggle a little bit with the the tank. <laughs> it just made me chuckle yeah. even more because the story was already bizarre. And it was like, well, how are we going to get across the chaos way safely? You think, well, fight bravely. No, we're going to build a little <laughs> tank. <laughs> you, was, yeah, you it, say it's little. not a little tank, is no, it? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Got horses in it. It's like, yeah, there it seemed to be two different teams of horses inside this tank that they've built. There's also like a, a sort of a replica kind of swamp area for Kotsa to hang out in. It seems like yeah. Eric has got a full, a full like pure gym in there because he's working out every day and night whilst he's on the journey. So there's, there's a lot inside this little tank that they've covered in mithril in order to, to protect it. But then this is, so I'm I'm really torn on this as a story because I I don't think I liked it overall, but there are some details in it that I really really enjoyed. So the Kislev adventure I thought was a really fun little bit. The tank itself I I kind of find odd. I know there's lots of weird technology in the Warhammer world, so it's not the tanks existing so much as just why it needed to exist for this story, I guess. Yeah. But then Steve Baxter, the author, has gone to like real specific detail about some aspects of it where he's like okay well because eric is actually quite a competent character which i i do like as well when they first build the mithril protection they put iron around each piece of mithril armor in order to seal it together and then eric just says well no because now you've got the weak point being the iron so he kicks out a piece of the mithril it just comes straight out and he says that's not going to protect us you need to do it as a sort of interleaved bits of armor that's quite a nice detail because it shows us about Eric knowing what he's talking about and being quite competent. And it's also some, it means that Steve Baxter's kind of been thinking about well, what, what would we need in order to achieve this? There's also a, you know, cause it's totally sealed. So they have a magic air ring that's just generating air, bringing air into it from outside so they can breathe. And then they also have a sort of a magic mirror so they can see where they're going which are both nice details, um, but they don't have anything that accounts for for like the leavings of the horses, <laughs> which, you know, two teams of, of war horses in there, where, where is that stuff going? And, and so there's some details that are great. And then, but by having those, having explicitly talked about those, those practical details, you've then opened the door to all of the practical details you didn't cover, which is odd. Yes. Yeah, it is just, 
strange strange <laughs> i just find it too there's too many strange elements for me but it, I, I enjoyed the the ride i it made me chuckle in many places and there are bits i quite like eric as a character actually mm. and i think a story about him would have gone a lot further i mean i'd much rather eric was part of the north raiders from <laughs> from the reavers and you could have gone back to them and maybe he was the the survivor that yeah. got to go back and so his character being explored more in that sense would have been more powerful in the book than maybe this this yeah it's just too many odd choices for me that weren't required and then yeah uh, yeah i didn't like i liked eric i didn't like kotza at all and when he's revealed to be a human it, it's it's such an odd twist that it's almost meaningless really there was one other detail that i did really really like a lot and that's the, the magic air ring that they use in order to bring air inside the turtle actually allows an air elemental from the chaos wastes to slowly infiltrate and then it manifests and then they have to have a fight inside the turtle and i thought that was really cool and eric is really smart he uses like the flames on their fire in order to smoke out the the air elemental great scene really really cool really nice idea and a way of putting again kind of creating a sort of practical aspect of a magical thing which is quite nice Mm, yeah yeah that was that was a quite a cool scene and and some of the fight scenes there especially on their return from mm. the, sh the starship is quite good when they're kind of making that mad dash back towards back out of the waste and you come across the slanishy and the, it, it's good and the the crazy horse thing at the end is uh, yeah that was cool the, the mutations and things you mentioned in the in the patreon chat about it being like the thing and that was yeah. exactly what i thought about when i was reading it i thought this is yeah so there was some good elements in there but it was the presentation of those ideas were haphazard and it felt like there were quite a few stories it's almost like you sat around a blackboard it wouldn't have been a whiteboard at the time maybe but I sat around and said right shoot some ideas and everyone put their ideas for a story up and he goes you know what i'm gonna make one story from this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna use it all <laughs> it's kind of <laughs> yeah and we're not we haven't even touched on the fact that it's a spaceship as well that yeah. they're going to find yeah. a spaceship which as you said before, some of those sci-fi elements did exist in the Warhammer world. That that's in there. It's in the the earliest editions with the scenarios. Like Richard Halliwell was writing scenarios with Amazons with guns and all sorts. That and they mentioned a chainsaw attacking them at one point. That, yeah, they? but it's it's like where did that come from? <laughs> yes, that's my issue with it. I I don't have a problem with those sort of uh, sci-fi elements. That's fun. They can be integrated in a really interesting way. I suppose my issue here was just how pedestrian it felt because mm -hmm. there was no sense of wonder to it. Eric and Coatser are both really chilled out and, and seem fully aware of all of the sci-fi stuff and they just take it in their stride. So yeah, Eric mentions, oh, I think, I think that's a, a chainsaw <laughs> just like on the, on the outside of the, the tank. And then when they find the spaceship, both of them are just like in within a couple of lines are just like, well, I think this, it might not be a regular ship. Maybe it's a spaceship. Maybe they need oxygen because they're going between planets. And they're both just like, yeah, that's, that makes sense. Right. That sounds about right. They're just re yeah. really chilled out on it. And, I, and that kind of saps a bit of the fun and a bit of the wonder for me because they didn't seem to care about it, which is odd. Yeah. They, sh they really shouldn't know what it is. Yeah. <laughs> It's it's yeah it's fun. It was I wrote at the end of wow what a ride and it was it was <laughs> it was definitely a definitely a ride and I, I've enjoyed exploring it and having you know it's fun to have a conversation around it because it is mm. so strange. But yeah, it wouldn't be so. I wouldn't be rushing out to say, <laughs> guess what we're in. My son's called Jacob. Jacob, what do you what would you like to tonight? I've got a story. <laughs> I wouldn't. I probably wouldn't pick it. It wouldn't 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 really be the right thing because he'd just be like dad what's going on <laughs> um and he'd be right yeah but entertainment it was it was entertaining it it, it maybe it took a little bit long I, I think jim ball in the patreon chat summed it up in quite a, a succinct way i think he said i i was really excited about the promise of the story when it started which i think is why i got so frustrated as it clunked along and i I agree with that. I think there are there's so much promise in there. It's a cool setup. There are some cool ideas throughout, but it just didn't feel like a 
a sort of nicely progressing, interesting story. It felt like it just sort of dragged out a bit because it wasn't mm -hmm. quite cohesive. Yeah. Yeah, that can make sense. I think that's a fair reflection. Yeah. Right. We're going to get on to the title entry for this series, The Ignorant Armies by Jack Yeovil. This one is about a pair of warriors, Johann von Mecklenburg and his mentor Vukotic, who undertake a 10-year quest to try and find Johann's brother, Wolf, who has been abducted by a chaos lord and his warband. They attacked the Mecklenburg estate, they killed the family, they took Wolf away, and then they've just rampaged through the Empire, and now they've gone up through Kislev and out into the Chaos Wastes, and that is where our heroes have followed them. They arrive at a massive chaotic battlefield where every night warriors of Chaos meet and fight one another just to prove who is the best Chaos warrior, the Chaos Lord, who should inherit the the sort of mantle of, of the, the Chosen One or the Ever Chosen or whatever it might be. And in the heart of this, this strange battlefield where every night this fight takes place, there is an inn full of very strange characters who loot the bodies at night, uh, during the day, sorry, and then at night they just cower and hide because the fighting's happening all around them. Johan and Vukotic managed to find the Chaos Lord who, who had abducted Wolf, and he tells them that actually Wolf has now taken over the warband and Cicatrix, uh, the villain, has now been sort of ousted and is about to die. And then Johan has to go and fight Wolf. They have a battle. Vukotic sacrifices himself and uses his blood in a Sigmarite act uh, sort of uh, incantation he uses his own blood to purify wolf and to bring him back from his chaotic form which is like a wolf man back to a human and the two brothers are then able to embrace and ultimately walk away so there's a lot to this story it's it's the longest story in the book how did you feel about the ignorant armies i really really like this one um, I thought the first couple of pages felt quite modern in the style of writing. It could almost be a beginning to a modern day black library novel. Um, it was quite dark. Uh, and they're, they're describing having to kill the horse to eat as the horse is sickly and they're, they're, they're hungry. They're, they've run out of food. It's, um, I quite liked it. I think I, I made a note right early doors saying this just, just reads or feels like a normal modern day Warhammer novel as it progresses. The, the, the age of the novel, so to speak, comes to the fore more so that that's not about not nothing to do with the style of the writing and such more to do with the way that chaos is, is, is viewed and described, I think, which is slightly different to what it is now. And that's the only reason that changed. Um, I really like the way it's written. I quite like the pacing of it works, works quite well. There is a feeling of, of jeopardy and you don't really know where it's, where it's, where it's going to end, I suppose. Um, and it's pretty dark all the way through. Yeah. And I, yeah, I really, really enjoyed it. I really like the interactions between, um, um, Johan and, and Vukadic, I really like the sort of that kind of his mentor, but now he respects him that he's a grown man. And clearly over the 10 years of this 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 journey, they've both become even better warriors, excellent warriors. And they've seen some stuff <laughs> <laughs> over, the, over the years. Um, and I just I really liked it. It was it was it's a simple story of 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 um of a broken family i suppose with nothing feels like he has nothing left to do other than go on the road and try to avenge um his his family's death and, and try and find his brother even though it may be hope you'd imagine he thinks it's probably hopeless and he's not going to get to do it mm. um i didn't expect the ending i didn't expect to, for him to kind of be reunited with his his rechanged brother but mm. i think as a child his brother was he sort of changed back to the way he was by the time he was um abducted wasn't he so back as a child i think it mentioned so i might be dreaming that part i don't I remember I... that it might it could be he maybe, I, maybe still I misread got, it he still has the same wound so johan yes. had, had wounded him with an arrow when they were younger and he yeah. thinks that that is the thing that caused wolf to kind of become a bit distant and maybe set him on a pathway that would lead him to embracing chaos 
So he has that open wound again, which I guess is to represent the fact that there's a second chance to not diverge from that one inflection point. But I don't yes. remember. It could be that he was he was young again. I don't recall that that detail. Mm, might have misremembered it. We're, we're, but but it's I didn't expect that to happen. I didn't expect there to be a happy end or mm. relatively happy end. Sure. There's a lot. Yeah. There's a lot of death before that. <laughs> it felt like that he was just going to be either forced to kill his brother or was ultimately going to be killed by his brother, mm. um, because he's dark. But that was you know there's a little bit of light at the end of that story and and. and Apart from maybe say Gotrick and Felix, where there's a little bit of levity, you kind of most of them are fairly dark towards the end. There's not much of that kind of a, a happy ending, so to speak. It just feels like the first one where the almost the goal was achieved, the ultimate goal was sure. achieved. And maybe that's it being a longer story that was allowed more. Um, yeah, I say, I, I suppose you do. So the other, I think, has got a relatively happy ending as well. True. I suppose the, the, the apprentice look. You could argue so. I mean, maybe it's just the tone feels like they're mm. they're sad endings more than the the actual text. But I know what you mean. This one definitely was a very surprising happy ending. If it is indeed yes. a happy ending, it's, it's, too, almost, it's too good to be true. You wouldn't. Yeah. Yes. You you are the yeah. at the beginning. You're hoping. Well, is his brother still captive? And as soon as you find out or you work out, you realize that he's 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 he's, he's not captive. He's he's turned to chaos himself. Yeah. Uh, no point did I think, you know what, this, he's going to be back to normal. <laughs> I didn't see that coming. Um, yeah, and, but that's a lot of the other stories quite, are predictable. Yeah, it's seeded nicely early on as well. I think you get you get some of the stuff around Wolf and how Wolf might not be, whilst Johan had sort of developed into a young man by the time the, the chaos killed their family, uh, he developed into a young man who was going to go on to become an elect count and was going to be the sort of, you know, the noble one. And maybe Wolf would gone in a slightly different direction because of that incident where he got wounded. And then you also get an interaction, an encounter on their quest with some of the former workers at the estate. Yes. So I think it's the stable boy who's now been mutated into an enormous chaos warrior. Yes, and, and has no regrets about this. It's all his like fully embraced chaos, <laughs> and and they fight, and and Johan has to fight and kill him. And there's a real, there's a that you know that's kind of sets the tone for okay, well the people who were abducted or the people who who he knew from his childhood, Johan, are now, probably not all right. <laughs> exactly, yeah, exactly <laughs> that. Um, and I quite like there was also just a real sting in the tail of that when. Johan has sort of tried to talk him down a little bit during the fight. He's trying to tell this this sort of former stable boy, now chaos warrior. Uh, you know, we used to be friends. We used to, we we lived together at the estate, and you know why why are you sort of doing this? And at the very end, just before he dies, the the stable boy, chaos warrior, says we were never friends. You know, it, it's, there's not some rosy history here. I, essentially, he was a stable boy. He was a servant, and Johan was a lord. And yes. there's so you you even get the sort of class distinctions within that as well. Mm -hmm. That's quite interesting, I think. But yeah, I feel that 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 actual encounter, that fight that they have with a couple of mutants, and there's a Skaven in there as well, which is cool. Nice to see see the uh, the Rat Boys getting represented here in this set of <laughs> stories finally. But that's a really cool fight scene, I think, as well. It's quite yeah. tense. It's Very quite well dramatic. Yeah, re really well written, and then. I think to your point there as well around how this maybe starts off as a simpler story and it starts off in a very modern way. Because like you say, there is that real grittiness of we're going to have to kill the horse because we can't survive otherwise. That's a bleak opening to this story. And there's plenty of bleakness still to come. But there's also, by the time we get to that chaotic battlefield later on and we're introduced to this collection of odd characters who live in the inn, that it kind of feels more, it's not comedic necessarily, but there's certainly a an odd sort of lightness to, to those characters and the way they interact and the sort of descriptions of them being a bit more playful, I think. It's the strangest part of the story, their inclusion in many ways, because it's like, what's it doing there? And what are they really doing? We, we're, we're told practically what they're doing there. But, but, but why? Okay, so it's it's a little strange, isn't it? I, I quite like the idea of 
the the battlefield that they return to to for the, the the warriors to almost prove their worth so that only the, the the best of the best get to go on and and, and fully ascend maybe mm-hmm. but it is quite also a bit strange they go back to the the same place so it's like the chaos waste community five side of its pitch I or like something that, like that though. Yeah, it's like I the, like around the back of the rough, the taverns, like the rough pub there with the with the, the, the car, concrete pitches <laughs> around the back. Or something. But um, I don't dislike it at all. But it's the 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 the, the strangest part to me of the story that it seems that you could have told the story without the encounter with the people in the tavern. Um, yeah. they, they they use as a narrative device to 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 explain that that is the battlefield that people die there every day and we we strip the bodies and. The warriors will just come back every day, and it's. Mm. I think that that's why they're there to help tell that. Someone's got to tell that that part part of the story. But yeah, yeah, I, I think that's a fair. Yeah. yeah, it's certainly an odd, odd moment. I remember the first time I read it, and I was I was like, like, what is the explanation for these? Because there's no explanation for why the tavern is not destroyed during all of the battling and things like that. But I think that the idea that there is this, is just this this odd haven in the midst of all of this chaotic fighting but obviously it, it itself is corrupted and sinister in a way and i think we know so jack yeovil is actually the pseudonym for uh, kim newman who is a film reviewer has written loads of other novels as well since a big horror fan there's definitely that kind of horror movie aspect i think to this tavern and the people who are in it there's mm-hmm. almost um there's a, there's like the freaks kind of vibe to them and there's just a, you know they, there's almost the hills have eyes maybe even there's a collection of odd folk i mean one of them the mayor has a sword wound he's got a sword right through his chest that he hasn't removed because if he does then he'll he'll die yes uh, yeah and but then that that sort of so living with these kind of maladies and afflictions and there's a lot of other issues that those characters have there is a real oddness to the people who are there but then that's also like they they have to be odd in order to live where they live which is <laughs> amongst this sort of chaos fighting um maybe that's why they're left alone because they're they're yeah, not of any significance are they? They're... Probably, and I think that that does work within the within the bounds of the story as well. Because the chaos who are coming to fight on this battlefield, they are specifically there to fight one another to prove who is the best. So, kill in this instance, and I know chaos love a good slaughter and, and a, you know killing innocents and all that sort of stuff. The classic chaos day out, if you like, but in this case. They're only there to prove themselves, and that proves nothing by taking those guys out. Because there's a really, mm-hmm. I, I quite like this, and I know it's not necessarily that chaos, certainly in a modern version. But the there's a duel that Johan is having at the very end of the story. He's had to fight through the whole night, protecting Wolf, who's sort of in a cocoon and and is about to come back as his his former self. So Johan has had to fight the other chaos lords in order to to not get killed himself. And as the sun comes up, the the chaos monstrosity that he's fighting just kind of salutes and is just like, are you going to be here tonight? Because we can continue fighting then if you want. And Johan's like, no, I'm not. This is it for me. And the <laughs> and the chaos lord guy is just disappointed about it. It's just like, fair enough, you know, and just walks off. And there's kind of this weird honor aspect to it as well, which I quite liked. Yeah, I, liked I like that. Yeah. It's yeah. <laughs> it's very strange. It is very strange, but I also quite like that within the Warhammer world, you can do a version of chaos that, because the machinations of chaos and their plans and what they want, the chaos gods, they've all got a little bit of zinch in them. They all want weird stuff that we mere mortals can never truly understand. So them doing stuff like this or having their followers do stuff like this, I quite like because it's just, that doesn't make any sense, at least to me. It makes some kind of sense to the chaos gods, I guess. Yes, yeah, I agree. And ultimately, they can, at this time especially, you can do anything you want with chaos. That was where the freedom of your imagination it was really set free, wasn't it? And I think that's mm. explored in the way they're, um, uh, in the different ways they're they're encountered in these stories. Yeah, yeah. There's a there's a few nice little bits of uh, 
cinematic reference as well. And and an, another thing mentioned in the old Hammer fiction podcast, so Lewis mentions that the Searchers, the John Ford film with John Wayne in it, it mm. is a massive inspiration for this particular story. In that film, John Wayne has to go on a five year search to find his niece who has been abducted by um, a, a war band who have, who have attacked their homestead and then taken her away. And then when he does find her, the actual chief who had taken her is called uh, Cicatriz. And the name right. of the Chaos Lord in this story is Cicatrix um, yeah. or Cicatrice. So there's obviously like a name reference there. The fact that the searchers has that similar kind of structure and that kind of time, because 10 years is a long time to be searching through the empire and through the chaos wastes, I think. Yes. Um, yes. <laughs> but I think that's, that's fun. And it, again, the sort of Kim Newman drawing on filmic inspiration. There's also a poem that opens the story, the Matthew Arnold poem, Dover Beach, which is where the reference, the line about the ignorant armies clashing by night comes from. I I don't I'm not a I don't really understand poetry very well so I couldn't Same. analyze the original poem myself but I do like the line and the ignorant armies is such a good term especially for a group of chaos armies that are clashing yes. for the sake of it it's just such a it works so well I'm sure there's a deeper meaning there but yeah it's very good I agree definitely there is another fun bit of trivia is just that the characters Johan and Vukatic were created they were statted them up for Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay and put them yeah, into I've... White Dwarf 118. Yes, there you go yeah, look at it an no, amazing um, issue that one, a fantastic It is, I didn't realise when I heard you mention it the other day or someone, I can't remember who it was but it might have been yourself on the on the thing, I thought like, right if I got that one, so I've got most from that era and I did, and yes, it's a great issue without really sidetracking onto something else. <laughs> there's a lot of good stuff in there. Yeah, and there's actually going to be a few more. So across the initial GW books, several of the characters from these stories were actually put into White Dwarf for Warhammer fantasy roleplay primarily, but for, for some other purposes as well, including characters in the next and final story. So this is The Laughter of the Dark Gods by William Bill King. He opened the anthology and he closes it as well. This is a completely different story to what we've just seen in Go Tracker Felix. So in this one, we follow Kurt Von Deel, who has been ousted from his barony by his brothers, and he is leading a warband into the Chaos Wastes in search of the power that the Chaos Gods can give him in order to reclaim what he thinks is his birthright. And the story is essentially just the tale of someone going into the chaos wastes, not to come back out again without becoming chaos. This is not someone who wants to just survive. This is somebody who wants to become the chaos. So Kurt slowly starts to mutate over time. He's wearing the armor of a chaos warrior that he's defeated. He only has one member of his original party left. And that guy, Oleg, starts to turn into a beast man. He comes across a load of chaos dwarves and they fall in as part of his warband because he's such a powerful warrior. And then slowly over time, he just accumulates a massive warband, joins a big war host and lays siege and becomes just part of this big chaos army. And ultimately, Kurt and the other lords of the chaos army get into an argument about which direction they're going to go in and then fight and kill each other. And that's basically the story, just the descent into chaos for, for one yes. particular character. What were your thoughts coming out of this story? I'm a fan, probably because of that. I like the style of, of, of uh, Bill King. Um, I'm also familiar with the Von Deals because they're covered in the, the first sort of um, Gotrick and Felix omnibus. Right. So you, you, you see the other side of that story. You see the, the family that are basically living in a, in a, in a they're traveling, living in, in camps and things, looking for a new place to live because they've been banished. Um, so you've still got nobility there and you've got the servants and you've got a lot of their village traveling. Um, so it's yeah, another one, definitely catch up on that first book soon. So you'll, you'll see the connections <laughs> in a different way. It's really good. Um, but I, I do like the kind of the slow change you see for, for, for Kurt throughout the time. Um, he, he reflects a little bit at points um you know at some point he, he starts to realize that you know is this 
crazy you see him kind of almost battling with himself at times and then it's one element they talk about him thinking about home again and but then he can't really remember what home is anymore can't really remember the faces of his families and things mm. um so you see that slow change and i thought um prince dita was quite an interesting character in it as well because he almost becomes the the voice in his ear doesn't he mm. twisting it a little bit and he sort of um I, I, there's a there's a part where he um basically says that the chaos gods are just doing this for their amusement and uh and, and kurt's very yeah, angry so like, this is you cannot blaspheme the the, the chaos gods and, and and prince dita was like well why they all laugh and joke they you know this this is that that's this what they do that's what they expect you are the you are the one that's strange not me for having these reactions so you see that quite early on when they first meet and that comes back more and more mm. um and, and with the end you you see um it turns out that that's you know all of that's probably true at the end of the day he's um he, chaos he, he suppose it shows that chaos is banned you are is bad you are damned you're, you're on a route to nothing mm. um you are there for the god's amusement you have been fooled you think you're on a quest to power to enlightenment to freeing yourself from your family and from your your the world and the empire and you're going on to better things but you're you're not you're just a tool and a plaything of the chaos gods and they've seen you fight and yes you might be the greatest at the end um but ultimately you know you will die and you mm. will <laughs> and you will just provide entertainment for them um so but yeah i really enjoyed it there were a couple of a couple of very kind of Warhammer things for the time. The the Slanity champion, I made a note, so her name's Zella Silken Thighs or something like that. Did you <laughs> pick up on that? <laughs> I didn't. I didn't. Uh, but yeah, a Zella silk, Silken Thighs. Yeah, that's very of the of the era. Uh, <laughs> like, God. Um, and then there's there was a champion he um he fights that's clear references to the god Malau, which we don't see in modern day Warhammer anymore because of all the potential copyright issues and it's not part of their world. So there are nice little touches like that in it, but it's ultimately a pretty straightforward, simple story of um lots of blood and lust and fighting, you know. Of, of a cornate warrior but also that kind of the little bit of in, the introspection and retrospection of of his acts and his life and you know actually is it as good as he thought it was going to be but ultimately mm. it's it's not um but i thought it was good fun and well well written and um i liked it yeah it's up there yeah. in my top three probably yeah the, same for me the... same for me absolutely because i think it was like you say there there is more again like go trick and felix really there is more character to the story than i might have expected you know if you hear this is going to be the t the story of a a warrior marching into the chaos waste who becomes a chaos lord and slowly over time accrues a chaos warband that might sound like it's going to be pretty boring or at least there's not going to be a lot of nuance to this guy if he wants to be a chaos lord then that's going to be a pretty straightforward character arc but I think that mm -hmm. Bill King manages to find some really interesting stuff there. I mean, you do you get Oleg, his last remaining loyal warrior, who becomes just full, fully a beast man by the end of it. There's a point in time when he sort of looks back and Kurt says, You can leave if you want. I'm not gonna keep you. And he has to weigh up whether or not he thinks he will escape the chaos wastes or if he yes. should just stay yeah. and and submit to whatever's gonna happen to him. Obviously, he chooses to stay. But it's that it's not really a choice because he's he's going to lose either way, and that kind of is Kurt's deal as well. Once he's in, there's nothing else that can happen, and there's moments where he kind of regrets it, or moments where he thinks, like you say, this isn't quite what I thought I'd be getting out of it. But I quite like that there's not a stark kind of this is not the monkey's paw kind of version of chaos where you wish for something and you get like a twisted evil version of it i mean it's a, it's a little bit like that but it's not as it's not as just clear cut, clean cut as that kurt wants power and he gets power but over time it's kind of a different version of that journey mm -hmm. he doesn't just get the power that he would want to go and retake or reclaim his homelands he gets stronger he gets more chaotic he gets an army but it's kind of he can't he doesn't really get to use it in any way he might want to he's got all this power but it's it's being controlled by these chaos gods to their ends 
So yeah, there's kind of an absolutely. interesting thing there. I I quite I quite like that as well. It's handled very well. I, you, you, I think if it was written now, and I imagine there are stories written about Cornate warriors in 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 AOS now, mm. and I imagine they that they, they're a lot more straightforward. And whatever the fantasy version of Bolter porn is, that mm. was what they would probably follow. And 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 this that there is a lot more of that kind of discussion, as we both said around the path and whether it's worth it. There's little, little elements all the way through when it's like Oleg mentions, you know, you, you, your 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 face has got a bit more lump, few more lumps on it now. You're you're yeah, you know, it's uh, you're looking a bit different. You know, <laughs> hope that's all right. It's almost like um, reminded me of the fly. Oh, when, yeah. when when he sort of things you know things start to happen like his ear falls off and it's like um, well okay <laughs> you know it's probably worth it it's kind of this little there's little elements to the the changing of they've got no control over it they both recognize that he's probably not good not healthy mm -hmm. here's another bit when he mentioned that he was when he saw i think when he saw oleg again and he was more hunched over and he had a it's just that, that there was definitely a lot of recognizing that the changes aren't good yeah. always yeah um but like, like what that. else are you going to do at this point Is, but, you, yeah, you, you don't break you it or, yeah uh, you mentioned as well uh prince dieter the unchanging he's like a chaos lord who's wandering in the wastes who kind of lost his way he's sort of the voice of reason if if you can have reason in the chaos waste i thought he was a fantastic character very funny very interesting a really unusual type of chaos warrior because yeah. he he's fully aware of everything that's happening here. He's, and maybe that's why he's the unchanging. Maybe that's why he doesn't get mutated physically, at least because he's totally aware of the deals that are being made. He knows all about what the chaos wastes can do and will do and what the gods want from everybody, but he's kind of, a, he's just accepted it as well. And mm -hmm. he's really funny, a great character. I, I would love to see more of him. Sadly, I don't think we will because no. he's one of the chaos lords who gets killed at the end um and even that he accepts he just he doesn't even seem to have a dog in the fight about which direction to go in but he just ends up as part of the chaos lords all got to kill each other ending but he he could even be there at the behest of the chaos gods there to twist and turn and change the mind of 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 kurt or you know they're having fun it's like Zinchian almost, isn't it? Having fun, yeah. almost telling him the truth. We're going to tell you what's happening to you, yeah. but but you you can't stop it now. Anyway, we're just playing. This is part of the game they're playing yeah. is to to send this character there to tell him the truth, tell him what's going to happen, and, and and Kurt doesn't believe it at the time or chooses not to believe it and be obstinate, and 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 eventually it, it turns out to be right. So yeah, it's a good character and a very good plot device in in, in order to help sort of get you talk about those things rather than it just coming from inside Kurt's and Oleg's thoughts and the way their actions are. Other people are, you know, putting doubts in their minds as well. So I like it. It's good. Yeah. Yeah. Tommy Tornston in the Patreon chat said that it's a strong description of the descent into madness from the inside, well-written mm -hmm. and chaos dwarves. Yay. And I completely agree. <laughs> I really like that it is a great just descent into chaos, what it's like to go on that journey, what it's like to build a warband as well. It's kind of this fun bit of lore around someone's mm -hmm. army. And then the fact that you there could, is... You could build this. It'd be fun yeah, to build, build as an army. It's, it's in the White Dwarf issue as well. Yeah, you get the army and it's got the warband stats as well for like a, a load of different followers. Because absolutely, it's such a characterful army because you do just have well here's a unit of chaos dwarves but they're actually mutated chaos dwarves because they've been in the wastes for for ages as well then you've got beast men over here then you've got a, a chaos warrior d to the unchanging who's joined as well there's so much character to this war band that yeah it's really fun and i like this kind of story that kind of feels like it could be this could have been bill king's like chaos war band that he was using in third ed warhammer at the time for all we know it feels like that. He thought he'd just tell the story of how his guys ended up on the table. And that's great. I really like it. Yeah. That's probably why it works so well. And yeah. maybe, maybe why I, you know, the most obviously Warhammer of their era, but obviously Warhammer stories are, are his, are his, and he's the only one that's works in the studio, isn't he? He's the one writing the rules and things. Yeah, All the others true. are external authors. So 
I think yeah. the person who's nailed the the brief, if the brief was to be Warhammer, then then these for me anyway are the most Warhammer novels. Yeah, um, I think that's fair. I do love this one as a counterpoint to the to the <laughs> to the ignorant armies as well, because you've got a here a group of here a couple of heroes wandering into this battlefield and finding out okay, chaos just fights itself as well as everybody else in order to yeah. prove who's the best, and then you see how the chaos guys end up on that battlefield as well more or less yes yeah they're, and they're i quite perfect, like that juxtaposition yeah. of those two stories especially you know putting them together how did you feel about this as the sort of closing out the collection i th well, i think it works for the reasons you, you've, you've mentioned there really it's um it just sort of those two dovetail those last two i think the strength of the story but it's also quite straightforward so it's not hard to get your head around just strong start and finish to, mm. to the book and i think that that's um important <laughs> in any book really but i think i i think it i don't know i think you can pick the book up and you really enjoy that first story and then you leave the book thinking well the last two stories are really good and strong and mm. a different order he may may leave you scratching your head a little bit more if the, if the starbo was at the end. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so I think the the choice of the order was very good. So that and I think that that's probably deliberate. Hmm. Um, it's almost like choosing a set list in, in on, a, on a music album. And I think hmm. that that's I think they've done it right here. I wouldn't really change the order of any of the stories. Um, and yeah, my well, my my favorite three are probably the first and the last two. Yeah. Um, and the others I'd be, you know, didn't dislike, but um, those those stronger three create a, a stronger lasting impression. So one at the beginning and two really good ones at the end, and it's um, yeah, it's been good fun. I like the like the book as a whole, but more so probably because of that. Yeah, yeah, I, I I agree. I think the the hit rate for me was really high. Even so, my least favorite story in the collection probably is the Starboat, but even that I still enjoyed. I still got something out of. I still enjoyed certain aspects of it. I really liked the other as well. I think that that for me is quite high up because there is just something else to that story. I had a hard mm -hmm. time trying to decide. Okay, Laughter of the Dark Gods, the other ignorant armies, maybe even Geheimnisnacht. You know, maybe there's four top stories for me out of eight. And and yeah, I even the stories that weren't sort of technically as strong, I guess, like Apprentice Look, was still for me great fun. I enjoyed reading it and sort of being part of that story. So yeah, I think that this was a very strong first collection for GW books. I think they did a great job. I mean, the theme that sort of ties it all together, I think, being that the chaos and the sort of mutation and 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 those kinds of fears. Obviously, there's a, there's a lot of real world aspects to that, and you know whether that might be the chaos wastes being relevant to sort of anxieties about nuclear fallout, and there's you could argue that there's certain aspects of capitalist mindsets in the 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 characters who are in the tavern in ignorant armies, and they sort of go out and loot the bodies and and sort of do this day after day after day, making themselves wealthy without changing anything or getting anything out of it. So there's a lot of that throughout a lot of the stories, which for me makes them feel like there's a little bit more than just the surface level fantasy adventures. Yes. Yeah. There's a bit of depth, a bit of a bit of subtext, and some very interesting ideas pretty much across all of them, I think. Yeah, I'd I'd agree. I think the it being a book of his time is definitely something there and you yeah. could explore that as a fairly deep conversation in itself if you wanted to um i think you see that, that within 40k at the time as well there's lots of um sort of political pastiches mm -hmm. lots of that and, and it's it's fun um and if you look at it on that level it is fun um so I, I quite enjoy that, and I quite enjoyed looking at those connections with some of the the comments. We you know we we, we talk about the the healthcare side of things. There's there's lots of little elements, and I and I like that. I think that's that's good, and it's definitely like the that kind of post apocalyptic, um, potentially post apocalyptic, the mutanty stuff, the uh, the the idea of the the political tensions at the time in terms of a global political tensions is is interesting as well. So I like that. I like the way they they sort of shape those stories. Um, and 
everything's obvious time isn't it that's part of mm. what made war have a at that time what it what it was um yeah. so it's, it's it's good to explore that that's probably the, the most interesting thing for me here was three or four of these stories i just genuinely really really like as stories but i've really enjoyed exploring them all mm. as part of that expansion of old hammer um yeah. and my interest in nostalgia and, and old hammer and and looking at them and, and, and in, a, in a different way whereas if i just picked up the book in isolation and i might have almost skimmed through a couple of the stories thinking well that's a bit strange okay i'm not really giving it any thought but at least in this context it's been a very interesting way of uh, approaching them and, and looking at them in a little bit more detail than you than you usually usually might do for a, for a, for a short story of 19 pages or so yeah yeah, I feel exactly the same. Yeah, I think it's been very interesting to have that lens to look at them through, knowing we were going to talk about them, knowing we were going to explore them, and also knowing that there's a lot of interesting history around them, you know, the, the way in which Warhammer was developing and how much these kinds of stories, although some of them have been forgotten and some of them might have been morphed and changed, there is a long tail to what was written here that has influenced a lot of, subsequent warhammer development so bringing mm -hmm. that into it and kind of with that context looking at these stories has been really interesting and i think will be interesting for the next 16 <laughs> months <laughs> if we make it i think we will through I all will, of yeah. the gw books we've got drakenfels coming up next so that is jack yeovil's first full-length novel in the warhammer world it is about a vampire and uh well the great enchanter as he's called a very powerful undead entity and the heroes who have dispatched him and the play that they're going to be putting on so that will be coming in september we're going to be reading through that and we're going to get together again both on the patreon towards the end of uh, september and that's an opportunity for all of my patrons to come and share some time talking with me live in a stream where we'll actually go through all of that good stuff and talk about what we thought the story was, what the themes were, what our favorite characters were and all the trivia and stuff like that. And then Stu and I will be getting back together to do another conversation like this, where we talk about all of that good stuff again and bring it to life for everybody who just wants to follow along on the channel. Stu, where can people find you in the meantime? Well, miniature realms, um, pretty much anywhere. So it's a YouTube channel in terms of of, of stuff like this. But I'm a commission painter by day job, so uh, you'll find me on a sort of Facebook and Instagram and X. It's called now, not Twitter, isn't it? <laughs> and um, and Threads and all this. So if you search miniature realms anywhere, you'll 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 probably find it. Um, and my channel is a, a real mix. There's lots of Warhammer type stuff. I do cover historical stuff as well. And because I paint for a day job, there's lots of painting tutorials and things. Fantastic. Great stuff. Yeah. And you just did a Chaos Warrior, in fact, I think, didn't you as well? I have. Yeah. That was my, at the time of recording, this was my last um, Warhammer, the old world related yeah. or fantasy related tutorial. Yeah. So I'm having Any chance that that is Prince Dieter the Unchanging? It could be. It could be. <laughs> <laughs> He's now my favorite Chaos Warrior of, of all. He's um yeah, I didn't picture him like that. I don't know why. I think uh might be fun to explore that as a as a as a miniature thing. This <laughs> might give me some other ideas. Great stuff. I've got time for them. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Stu, for joining me in this. Thank you, everybody else, for joining us to listen to us talk about the ignorant armies the collection of stories the first book by gw books please in the comments let us know what you thought about the stories what were your favorites what were your favorite scenes what do you think worked and didn't work what are you looking forward to in the next book drakenfels so until then thank you very much for watching i'm jordan this is Stu, and this is jordan sorcery's gw books club <laughs>